the recording and YouTube is now live, so you guys are ready to go whenever you're ready. I think we are still waiting for a couple more um, community members on the budget committee. So we are going to maybe give it a minute or two before we get started. It does look like we do have a quorum uh, with six members of the 10 member committee. So we can proceed even with the participation right here, but let's give the benefit of the other community, community members a couple minutes. And thank you, Kevin, for reading through a very long list of attendees to find those members. You are welcome. And Kevin, if you see Latricia out there, we will need to promote Latricia as a panelist as well. Absolutely. <clears throat> I can't remember, is this streaming to YouTube right now as well on our YouTube channel? Yes, it is. Latricia is in the attendee list with her raised hand. Yes, I just moved her over. Oh, there is KS. Hello, oh. can you hear me? I had, I had no idea, that was muted. Um, so Kevin, if you can promote Sheila Gimbroni and uh, Stacy Sheila as well, um, both of them will be as a later part of the presentation, but I would like to include them as part of the introduction for the staff presentation team. Absolutely, Jack. Yep. They're on the service district for lighting part. Hello, Jack. This is Venkat. Can you hear me? Hi, Venkat. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much. We're just giving everyone a little, a few more minutes, a few extra minutes to join in. Uh, so far, for the community, we have all commissioners in the room, and then for the community members, uh, it's you and uh, Caesar. Okay. We're still waiting a couple more minutes. Okay, I'll mute. Also, I would like to say Eid Mubarak to anybody watching. Sorry, see there. Uh, Eid Mubarak, if that applies to anybody watching this right now. Yes. All right, we're at 5.35, so I want to do a quick um, call to the presenting uh, presented members and uh, see if uh, do you guys want to get started with the process. I would suggest we get started. We have a packed agenda ahead of us <laughs> tonight. Okay, and by my past experience, uh, some of those um, committee members may be running late uh, into the meeting and I do have my cell phone with me just in case any of them run into technical issues. So I will tr try to keep an eye out. 
uh, for that as well. All right. So we are going to get the presentation rolling. We have are on the on the cover page. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, thank you. Now it's Tanya. So good evening, budget committee members and those viewing. We are very pleased to be here tonight on this gorgeous spring evening. So thank you um, for spending time with us. Tonight's um, discussion is very important. The budget policy is one of the most important budget uh, policy documents that the board um, ultimately approves each year. So thank you for being here um, and we look forward to the conversation this evening. Next slide. So with that, we will start into introductions and Jack um, has agreed to kind of help us walk through how to best um, coordinate introductions since we are in this wonderful virtual environment. Thank you, Tanya. Wonderful indeed. Sometimes we do need to learn a few tricks to we don't have a table to go around anymore. So I decided for us, uh, we're going to go through the commissioners and then the community members and then also the presentation staff for tonight's uh, budget presentation. So we'll start with uh, Chair Harrington. Good morning, everyone. This is Catherine Harrington, the uh, elected at-large chair of your five-member Washington County Board of Commissioners. And I'll turn it over to our District 1 Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's good to see you. I agree with you, Cesar. Eid Mubarak to everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Nafisa Fai, and I'm um, District 1 Commissioner. And I'll turn it to District 2. Thank you, Commissioner Fai, Eid Mubarak as well. Um, I, I also wanted to make sure that all of our audience knows that I am certain that our chair knows it's not morning time and she meant to say, <laughs> she meant to say good evening. I'm Pam Treese, District 2, and I'll turn it to District 3. Hi, I'm Roy Rogers. I'm from District 3, which is the southeast quadrant of, this, of the county that encompasses about seven cities. And so I would uh, forward that to Jerry Willie, who's in District 4. Good evening, everybody. And yes, welcome from District 4. Uh, I am on the western side of the county, primarily uh, a part of Hillsboro, but the rest of it is all rural uh, cities. And so thanks for spending some time with us this evening. And I'll turn it back to the chair. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to... Uh... Welcome our colleagues on the budget committee, our community members. So Jack, I'll turn it over to you to help facilitate our introductions this evening. Thank you, Chair Harrington. And we do have currently have two community members on the budget committee that's uh, in presence, in attendance. And then we will start alphabetically by Caesar first. Hello, hello everybody. My name is Caesar, and uh, I'm excited to be here. It was really exciting reading over the budget summary, so I'm excited to talk more in depth or hear more from all of you experts. So, Thank you, Cesar. And then we'll move on to Venkat. Hello, and good evening to all of you. My name is Venkat. I, um, this is, I think, my third budget committee meeting. I'm the Senior Director for Artificial Intelligence Computing at NVIDIA Corporation. And I also serve on the Oregon Governor's Workforce and Talent Development Board. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, Venkat. And I'm just doing a quick check to see if is there are any additional community members that joined in. I so, did. Far, so far, Jack, I have not seen anyone else. You will see uh, Karen Bolin join soon. I texted her and uh, she texted me back from her car. She's on her way. Perfect. Thank you for the update, Chair. And then we'll move on to the presentation staff. So start with uh, Tanya. So thank you, Jack. And I uh, previously introduced myself, uh, Tanya Angie, County Administrator, and I will pass it to Latricia Tillman. 
And good evening, everybody. My name is Latricia Tillman, and I'm the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer. And Eid Mubarak to everybody. And um, thank you, Commissioner Therese, for acknowledging Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Thank you, Latricia. And uh, I'll jump in. My name is Jack Liang. I, if you haven't seen me presenting before, I am the Washington County Chief Financial Officer, and I will be the facilitator of tonight's meeting. And then we'll move on to Sia. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sia Lindstrom, and I am the Interim Assistant County Administrator, and I will turn it over to Ruth. Uh, Ruth, you are on mute. You are on mute, Ruth. <laughs> Okay, I just got a new computer, so I'm trying to get used to everything here. Uh, hi, I'm Ruth Osuna, Deputy County Administrator. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Ruth. And I'll pass it on to Erin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Erin Calvert. I'm a Deputy County Administrator. I'll pass it back to Jack. Let's, let's see if we make, make up for a run and everybody do that at least one time tonight. Uh, we'll pass it on to Sheila Jim Brony. Good evening, Sheila Jim Brony. I work for the Department of Land Use and Trace, uh, Transportation. I'm their administrative manager. And I will be presenting uh, with my colleague, Stacia Sheila, for the uh, SDL budget tonight. Thank you, Sheila. And uh, Stacia? Hi, I'm Stacia Sheeler. I'm the Service District for Lighting Coordinator in Land Use and Transportation. And for some reason, my video won't start. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, Stacia. I believe that is everybody that is in attendance right now. Oh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there it comes. All right, so we still don't have Karen yet. Um, uh, yes, oh, Jack, we, do. we do. We do have Karen. Yes, I just don't see her on screen yet. Karen, would you like to do a self introduction? So I apologize for being late. I went to the Aloha Community Farmers Market and just had such a good time. So it's open <laughs> if you all are interested every Thursday. Uh, Karen Bolin, uh, business owner in Aloha and um, excited to be here to talk about money. Woo -hoo. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. So tonight, we as uh, Tanya mentioned, we do have a very fully packed agenda. We'll start with the uh, welcoming introductions and we have just gone through that. And then we'll go through a couple of committee actions. So there are two actions that the committee will need to take tonight. One is to elect um, a committee chair. And then the second is to review an adoption of the budget hearing procedures, which will be used and followed as a budget hearing scheduled on May 26. And then we'll move on to the budget presentation, which covers the fiscal year 2021-22 county budget presentation first. And then we will have the fiscal year 2021-22 service district for lighting number one budget presentation. And then we'll discuss about the next steps and then adjournment. So at the end of each of this uh, budget presentations, we do have a collaboration time for the committee to discuss with each other on this year's budget and uh, ask either have questions or discussions. So we do have time building for that. But in the meantime, on any of the slides, if you do have a question, um, feel free to stop us uh, in the presentation as well. So we are very flexible in terms of answering questions. And uh, next slide. So if I may help facilitate the very first part of the action, since we don't have a committee chair for this year yet, is that uh, I have listed uh, out all of the committee members both the board of commissioners and the community members uh, in this table. So this is where we would like to solicit a nomination of a committee chair. Can that slide be any bigger? I think, so it depends on the device that you're working with, uh, Karen. I think it's already on full screen okay. with our Zoom okay. right here. Karen, I can definitely read out the names. If you were to go to the uh, right side of your slide next to the windows, you should be able to drag it and make it bigger if you need it bigger on your personal device. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so 
I'm hoping that we can have one of our community members serve as the chair. And you might have seen in the documents that uh, Jack sent to us, there is a handy dandy two pager that's a guide for the chairperson of the budget committee. So we, we are a positive group. Uh, so I don't know if we might have any volunteers from our community members. Uh, thus far, we have uh, Karen Bolin, Cesar Maldonado, and K.S. Bakathraman. Um, so might any of the any of the three of you or all three of you be willing and interested? Unfortunately, I had sent a note to Jack earlier uh, that I may have to drop off at seven, so I won't be here for the duration of the meeting, so I'd like to remove myself from consideration for chair, uh, if that's okay. No worries. And since I'm new, I'd rather not be it if I don't have to be, since, again, I don't think it's fair since I'm still learning how everything works. All right, you guys, that's not fair. <laughs> Why oh, you'd be so good at it, Karen. Oh my gosh, you guys. <laughs> You're experienced as well. All right, I'll do it. So I'd like Thank to you, make Karen. Yeah. So Cesar, would you like to make the motion to uh appoint Karen as the chairperson of our budget committee? Sure. Uh is there a formal way to say that? Do I just say I uh, I move to nominate Karen Boland for the committee chair? Perfect. And I'll second. second it. I'll second it. This is Venkat. Wonderful. So all oh. those in favor, please I'll... vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Anyone opposed? Say nay or raise your hand. It's official that you're here by our budget committee chair. Thank when you very much. When you're late into being chair, that'll, that'll teach me. <laughs> All right. So I didn't see the document. So Jack, can you coach me a little bit? Absolutely. So the document, um, basically, the, our next action is the chair's responsibility. Is uh, well, has everyone had a chance to take a look at and review the adoption of the committee procedures? That was another one of the documents that Jack sent us. Um, it's not in the book. It's not in this. It's Correct. not part of the book. It's a, a sep separate document. Okay. Yeah. So basically it just talks about the fact that we are the budget committee, uh, that uh, the committee meeting tonight includes the budget transmittal, which will be presented by our uh, Chief Administrative Office, as well as our Support Services Financial um, Division, that uh, we are the Fiscal Planning Advisory Committee, that we have elected uh, a chair for our committee, that uh, we'll have this meeting tonight where we'll receive the budget message, the proposed document, have some opportunity for discussion and Q&A and that we'll have a board hearing on May 26th that will provide members of the public with an opportunity to ask questions about and comment on the budget document. From there, we'll be approving the budget as submitted by the budget officer or revised by the budget committee. And then that will be approved by the budget committee and specify the the tax rate, which is referred to as the ad valorem property tax amount uh, or the rate for all the funds. So the rest of the document that then goes on to uh, provide the link to the document, uh, an email address for Jack, finance underscore budget at co.washington.or.us. Once again, highlights the process for that public hearing um, and also at the bottom notes the uh, applicable state law that a quorum is represented by half of our budget committee membership plus one. So Jack's always on the lookout to make sure we have quorum. 
and that we need to have an any action requires a affirmative vote of a majority of our membership and not just the members present. Um, so that will mean that we need at least six members of the Washington County and Service District for Lighting Number One Budget Committee uh, to participate in any such votes. So that's a summary of the procedures just in case you don't have it right in front of you. Jack, did I, did, did I do okay, Jack, in presenting that? You did a such an excellent job, Chair Harrington. Yeah. I think we need to enlist you to do that every year. <laughs> do we need Thank a you. motion to adopt those, or are they? that's what you're presenting, or what? Yes, so a the, the required action would be adoption of the proce procedure, okay. so it becomes an official procedure of the next uh, budget hearing. Okay, so does somebody want to make a motion to adopt those procedures that Catherine just outlined? Can I ask, are there any questions first? Okay. Does anyone have any questions or is everyone comfortable with that? Okay, well, I'll make a motion that we approve the budget hearing procedures as summarized and available to us. Is there a second? Commissioner Rogers seconded. Seconds. Okay, moved and seconded that we adopt or accept the uh, budget committee guidelines as presented. All those in favor, thumbs up. Hands up, thumbs up. All those opposed, same sign. They are approved. Next. All right. All right, let's go. Thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> and uh, the next part is our the fiscal year 2021-22 county budget presentation. Next okay. slide, please. All right, I'll pass it on to Tanya to provide an overview of the major themes and the budget message of this year's budget. Thank you, Jack, and good evening, budget committee members. This is Washington County's second proposed budget delivered during the COVID pandemic. As a community, we've had multiple crises happening at once, including public health, economic, housing, racial disparities, and severe events such as wildfires, snow, and ice storms. Wow, that's a lot. I want to take this time to pause and recognize my colleagues and point out the heroic work of counties through it all. We are still in response mode, but we have hope. And I'm here to share we, are, we have servant leaders at all levels of this organization, and I celebrate them each and every day and feel fortunate to work alongside them. Related to the pandemic, though we remain at high risk, cases and hospitalizations are beginning to level off. That gives us hope. The spread of the virus and shutdown activity disproportionately affected the Latinx community, both in terms of health and economic impact. This is an area that needs att ongoing attention and investment as we move forward. On the bright side, the side of hope, Governor Brown is shifting the focus from case levels to vaccination rates when it comes to what level of public health restrictions must be in place. Hope and good news, the percentage of vaccinated Washington County residents is at 61% of the eligible population with at least one dose. We are closing in on the governor's target of 70% for significant reopening. That provides hope. And so let's talk a bit about economic recovery. We are still climbing out of job deficit caused by the pandemic, especially in the leisure and hospitality area. Again, there has been a disproportionate impact on our Latinx community. As John Tapanga of Eco Northwest pointed out in his presentation to the board last week, many economists expect full recovery by late 2023, which is much faster than predicted. That gives us hope. However, I want to raise caution. Economic recoveries frequently leave some behind, underscoring the continued focus on racial equity. So let's move to our financial picture. 
And I'll let Jack get into the details as he does so well, but let me allow let me be allowed to speak a few minutes regarding some key points about our financial situation. Property taxes. This is our main source of discretionary revenue and it remains stable. But the system in Oregon is constraining, not just for Washington County, but for all local governments. Further details on this are provided in the budget summary. We are very thankful to voters for passage of both the library and public safety levies last year. My message would be dramatically different had either of those measures failed. So let's move on to other sources of revenue. We've experienced sharp declines in revenue connected to, the, to economic activity. Some of those areas include the transient lodging tax and building and permitting fees. This has significantly impacted special funds, leading to reserve spending and other measures we've put in place. And we'll get into further details later on in this presentation. And we've been fortunate to have one-time federal aid. The board has been navigating the opportunities and challenges of receiving one-time federal relief funds. We are grateful to our entire federal delegation for their continued support and advocacy. So these federal funds really have come in, two, in three tranches. The first tranche we experienced this current fiscal year, and that's the CARES Act, which resulted in 104.6 million. And that came to the county in spring of 2020, just in time for response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through the board's leadership, partnerships with fellow local governments and community-based organizations, we rapidly scaled up public health response and mitigated the worst effects of the pandemic. I'd encourage you all and members of the community to read the full report on the use of the 104.6 million, .6 million. Um, that full report is on the county's website and it's titled, Lift Us Up, Keep Us Going. So now we're shifting focus to the American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan will come in two tranches of federal funding. We're expecting 5.8, 5, uh, excuse me, 58.3, too many points and dollars um, in this conversation, this calendar year, and 58.3 will, fo will follow thereafter. There is a key difference between the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. That key difference is that Amer the American Rescue Plan will involve direct payments to our city partners and other partners as well. I know that they are very appreciative of this change. The board is engaged in early di discussions around that expenditure framework of the American Rescue Plan funding. So you will not see that reflected in, in the proposed budget. So let's talk a little bit more about that dilemma of one-time funds. Jack will walk through how the proposed budget relies on several one-time sources of revenue to reach balance and reach the goals set by our board. Washington County would be in a far different place without the one-time federal dollars that enabled us to reach the pandemic head on. But important to remember that many of the ongoing systemic issues that we face within our community and within our systems of county services cannot be adequately addressed with just one-time funding. If we're not careful and thoughtful of our use of one-time funding, we could mask ongoing financial challenges at the county. Finally, I'll draw your attention to the various priorities beyond our pandemic response and, and recovery, which are highlighted in this budget. And you'll hear more about each of these priorities throughout the evening. Equity, diversity, and inclusion is a board initiative since adoption of the equity resolution in February of 2020. The Office of Equity is already meeting key milestones such as establishing advisory bodies, both internal and coming soon, an external advisory body. In a moment, Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer Latricia Tillman will provide a brief overview of what to expect in the future when equity is part of our budget process. 
Housing affordability. We are ramping up the regional bond and supportive housing services programs. Also continuing the third of five years in annual investments in the amount of 4 million from the general fund to expand the affordable housing supply. Deputy County Administrator Ruth Osana will have more details later in the presentation. Economic development. I have appointed the county's first economic development manager, Matt Craigie, and we are so fortunate he has chose Washington County. This puts in place, this is a key action to put in place the board's priority in motion. Equity will be a central focus of our economic development program. Matt is providing staff leadership and project management around the American Rescue Plan as the board discusses the prioritization framework. Transportation. This continues to be a very high priority throughout the community. Compared to other jurisdictions around the state, Washington County does have an advantage with property tax funding from the Major Streets Transportation Improvement Program countywide and Urban Maintenance District, Urban Unincorporated Area Only. This will be discussed further by Ruth as well. Public safety. Again, thank you voters. We continue to struggle um, with our community corrections funding level as the state of Oregon is not meeting their community, their obligations for community corrections funding. Aaron Calvert will dive into this detail further in the presentation. Capital investments, supporting county systems. Finally, uh, several multi-year upgrades of key facilities and technology systems is proposed in this capital budget. Budget com committee heard during orientation about some of this. This does include, which we are very excited about, a rebuild of the county's website. Jack will dive further into this detail later on. In conclusion, I wanna underscore a final thought for the budget committee. As stated at the beginning, a 2300 plus employee organization, we have risen collectively to the occasion for our community in ways no one could have ever predicted. And I joined this team partway through the pandemic and I'm so humbled and honored to serve alongside them each and every day. I'm grateful for their diligence, commitment, and perseverance to each and every community member of Washington County. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer, Latricia Tillman, for her update. Great, thank you, uh, Tanya. If we could go to the next slide. Okay, so equity, diversity, and inclusion is all about improvement, change, and forward movement. And we're early in the process of bringing the equity resolution that our board adopted last year to life. But as uh, Ms. Angie mentioned, we have done quite a lot of work over the past eight months to strengthen our equity foundation. Like uh, Caesar mentioned, we are also learning how everything works in our first cycle through the budget process. So we're with you. And the comments that I'll share here are considerations for all of you tonight, as well as um, how we move forward together. So when we think about equity in the budget process, that includes three critical components, data-driven decision-making, transparency and community engagement. So with data-driven decision-making, we really need to understand what racial inequities exist in Washington County. Um, and that means we need to have data that can be disaggregated by race, ethnicity, language, and other factors where inequities um, exist. And we need to know which ones our budget is intending to address. And data will help us to know how we are doing and help us to develop the metrics to track our progress. Transparency um, is also essential for equity. Um, equity requires us to be transparent in how we are allocating our dollars, including sharing what processes we, we are using to make those decisions and who is involved in shaping and implementing the process. 
We need to clearly communicate our expectation for advancing equity throughout our budget process, including identifying or creating specific line items that could help us demonstrate how we are investing in the fundamental elements of equity, like language access, interpretation, and translation. Community engagement, also essential in making sure that we have um, diverse community members, like in this committee, um, who are a part of the conversation of how we allocate our public dollars. In this past fall, we had three community investment conversations, which were wonderful steps forward and moving forward. We want to look at how to expand opportunities for community to weigh in to our public um, budgeting process. The focus of our investments um, should be looking at equitable access to county services, quality of services, as well as outcomes. Um, in our access focus, we need to assure equitable access to Washington County services. And so again, that points us back to disaggregating who's using our services by race, ethnicity, and language, and exploring how this matches what we know the need is. Um, and again, tying our investments to eliminating those barriers to access. In quality, we need to be looking at how our service delivery is meeting the unique cultural norms, values, and social positioning of diverse communities. So this acknowledges that a one-size-fits-all approach to policy or program does not work well for all communities. Um, we need investments that transform the environments that create and sustain inequities, um, not just help people cope with the consequences of inequity. Um, and today I learned of a quote by uh, Henry David Thoreau, who said, for every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. So a question for us is, are our investments striking at the root or hacking at the leaves? Um, and then for outcomes focus, I think that quote applies here as well. How do we look at the return on our investments disaggregated by race and ethnicity? How do we know that we're moving toward equity in the outcomes that we're investing in? Um, so again, that cycles us all the way back to both data-driven decision-making and community engagement, because we will not just see in the numbers, but we'll hear from community about the difference that our investments are making and the ways that we're moving toward equity. Um, that's all I have to share from this slide, so I'll pass it back to Ms. Angie. And I'll pass it right to Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Latricia. Such inspiring um, explanation of how do we build equity in the budget process. And then as uh, Latricia explains that we are early in the process, we're definitely starting the work, starting to collect data, starting to do the thought process. And then we are actually anticipating to, to make a lot of more progresses in the next year's um, budget process as well. Thank you. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So we do have a couple of new funds and programs um, that is covered in this uh, presentation. And then the two new funds that was uh, created do either during the later part of last, uh, when I say last fiscal year, it's really this fiscal year, during the fiscal year 2021. And then, um, so the, those two funds are the Fund 221, the Supportive Housing Service Revenue Fund, and then also the fund 245, which is a housing production opportunity fund. Both of these funds activities will be covered later in the functional area presentations. And then we also have a couple of new programs. Quite a few of them are related directly to the COVID-19 response. As you can see on the slide, there are four new programs that's um, covered under the fund 155 and fund 164, which are specifically toward COVID-19 response and the community development that is associated with COVID-19 impacts. And then we also have two new programs that's based on a, a management structure change, which is uh, the ITS and infrastructure services on both the operating side and the capital side. Next slide, please. So let's start talking about the numbers, which is uh, obviously my favorite part, um, is the total budget, that's where we start. So on this slide, you can see two charts 
on the left hand side is the illustration of the revenue. And then on the right hand side is the breakdown of the expenditures. Our total budget size is $1.4 billion roughly. And on the revenue side, um, we can, you can see that the couple larger pieces is the beginning fund balance as a part of the resources, is the inter intergovernmental, which really translates to the revenues we receive from other governments, like the federal government, the state government, uh, other government. And then we also have our taxes, which stands at 16%. Operating transfers in stands at 15%. And then we have smaller parts, which is the charges for services, fines and forfeitures, miscellaneous and the interdepartmental. On the expenditure side, this is where we break it down into categories. As you can see, the pie chart shows the two larger portion of our expenditures countywide is personnel services stand at 24% and the material and services, which is at 33%. So those are the two larger portions. And then we have operating transfer out, other interdepartmental capital outlay, as well as contingency, which represents the anticipated ending fund balance, which in layman's term, that means the amount that we don't anticipate to spend uh, as 13% of the total budget. And then next slide, please. So still on total budget, this is a, a different way of breaking down of that $1.4 billion. The smaller chart on the left-hand side is a breakdown between the general fund and the special fund portion. So the general funds is at 24% this year, 76% for the special funds combined. And if you have been part of the budget orientation, um, that's how the county's uh, funds are divided into categories. The general fund is where most of the discretionary funding and the discretionary expenditures are happening. And special funds usually carries a very specialized um, revenue source and a very specialized way to spend that funding. So a little def those are categorized as non-discretionary. And then on the right-hand side, that's another breakdown of the expenditure, the entire $1.4 billion which is breaking down into the functional areas. So the functional areas obviously each tied to a very specific areas of the community services that the county provide. We have the general government at 10%, public safety and justice at 16%, land use and transportation at 8%, housing, health and human services at 18%, culture, education and recreation, 5%. And then the two other parts which are not operating in nature is not operating at 25% and capital at 18%. We also have this non-departmental portion, which is less than 1%. And then from a change perspective, if you look at the table on the bottom left right there, from the fiscal year 2021 to fiscal year 21-22, the general fund part really did not change very much. We were holding at less than 1% of change. It's a special fund part that actually went down a little bit, quite a bit, which is 177, 137 million dollars worth of a decrease. And part of that is contributable to the one-time funding that Tanya mentioned uh, from the CARES Act CRF, which boosted last year's budget by $104 million. And this year, because of the um, American Rescue Plan funding did not come in at the time of the budget development. And that is why we have only a portion of that budgeted in this year's budget. And then we are planning on facilitating a supplemental budget process to capture the full scope of that funding. And then on the FTE side, we are growing 33.12 uh, FTE, which is about 1% growth. Next slide, please. So that was the total budget. Let's delve into the general fund a little bit more. As I was explaining, the general fund is the more discretionary portion of the county's resources. So starting on the left-hand side, we have the revenue breakdown. And you can see on general fund side, our larger portion of the revenues is really in property taxes. Oh, well, let me correct myself. All kinds of taxes is categorized in these areas. That includes property taxes, transient lodging taxes. So that supports the general fund operation, which stands at 38%. And then we have the operating transfer seen at 23% from other funds. And then this tip, which stands for major straight transportation Imp improvement program and the WCCLS, which stands for Washington County Cooperative Library Services and 19%. I may note both of those resources are also taxes and we keep we segregate them out to both represent those are historically separate taxes that has been dedicated to these services. So essentially general fund collects these taxes and then this taxes flows toward those um, services. And then we have a, a list of smaller 
venues of uh, revenues that comes in charges for services, fines and forfeitures, interfund revenue, intergovernmental revenue, again, money from other governments, licenses and permits, miscellaneous revenue that makes up the total revenue landscape of the general fund. On the right hand side, it's another expenditure breakdown based on the expenditure categories first. And again, our personnel services is our largest expense in general fund. And then we have the materials and services at 15% and the operating and transfers out at 29%. And then the smaller portion includes capital outlay, contingency, as well as the interdepartmental and other. So the total budget size for general fund, as indicated at the bottom, is 334 roughly um, million dollars for this year. Next slide, please. So out of the 334 million dollars, we have another expenditure breakdown by functional area. The larger part on the general fund are the general government portion and the public safety and justice portion. And then non-operating also takes up a large portion of the general fund. And then we have smaller portions, which is the land use and transportation, housing, health and human services, cultural education, recreation, and the non-departmental. And uh, a very common question I get is that, how come when it comes to general fund, the distribution between all the functional areas are so uneven? And uh, I have to say that it's due to the funding nature of some of these areas, like our land use and transportation, the MISTIP, the uh, um, WCCLS, all have a dedicated special fund um, revenue sources that comes in. And that's why when you look at the countywide budget, as a whole, the distribution among all the functional areas are actually fairly close to each other. And then when you look at general fund, it's uh, actually um, a little, appears a little bit uneven, but that doesn't represent the entire operation of Washington County as a whole. So on the right-hand side in the table, we have a comparison between the modified and the proposed budget this year. And for general fund overall, you can see that at the total line level, we have a pretty much 0% growth. Uh, actually, it's a little bit of a decrease compared to last year's budget. And uh, due to our financial prudency and the navigating the rising cost and uh, revenue coming in a little bit slower. So we're very prudent when building this year's pr proposed budget. And there's also a number breakdown, dollar breakdown for the general, for all of the functional areas that's covered under the general fund. And then as well as a percentage differences between uh, for each functional areas. Next slide, please. So when we talk about general fund, we have to talk about the general fund's fund balance. And that is actually the board direction via adopting a policy. And I apologize for the typo on the screen right there. It's actually supposed to be administ administrative policy 405, uh, fund balance targets and reservation policy uh, and reserve policy. So the board's direction through the policy is to maintain the general fund's fund balance at a minimum of 15% of general funds net revenue and a maximum of 20% of general fund net revenue. So, and some folks may ask, what is general funds net revenue? What does that mean? Um, and the, the general funds net revenue is calculated simply by take the total revenue, the gross revenue of general fund, and then minus out the pass-through piece um, of the tax base for the um, major street the improvement program, as well as the WCCLS, the library services. So that, that will constitute the general funds net revenue. And I do see a raised hand from Karen. Uh, Karen, what's your question? Okay, so um, on page 17 of the book, there was a comment about public safety and state funding obligations have fallen behind since 2006. So if you go back to the last slide, we're putting an additional million dollars. Is that because the state is not giving us what they promised or is that because of something else? That is such an excellent question, uh, Karen. So let me try to um, provide my perspective on it. And I would encourage any of the presentation team uh, to chime in and answer that. First of all, there's a difference in the budget message when they, um, provides the public safety, it really talk about a total budget perspective. So what that means, it includes general fund portion, the, um, the special fund portion as well. So, and the specifically this year, as Tanya mentioned, that we are definitely having a little bit of challenge in terms of funding in the Department of Community Corrections, which is a separate special fund. And then 
when it comes to the general fund, so let's flip back to the general fund, as you can see that the public safety and justice budget increased about 1%. And that increase is actually primarily due to the rising cost of personnel services via um, our retirement system, um, our rising birth rate and the medical benefit rate, all of that. Um, actually, all of that add up to be more than 1%. So internal to the county, we actually, uh, for this year, we instructed to look for um, close to 2% reduction after some of these hard increases that we're not able to sustain, uh, that we're not able to control. And then that's what landed us to the 1% range uh, for the general fund portion. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question, Karen? Well, I'm just concerned if we're getting promised money from the state and they're not going to deliver, that messes things up. And then I'm wondering if that will be the case with the feds, if they promise money and don't deliver. I, it, I'm, concer I'm concerned about that. So It's a very valid concern. Thank you. All right. Karen, Karen um, I appreciate that concern. And if we hold that thought a bit, there, when we get to the public safety slides, Erin mm -hmm. Calvert will speak a bit more about community corrections and the state impact. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. And then we'll flip back to this slide. So the max, minimum 15%, maximum 20% is our board policy for the general funds fund balance. Next slide, please. So we explained what the net revenue is and the general funds fund balance, as a reminder, some of you have seen this slide uh, in the past year in this format. We do have four components that goes into the general funds fund balance. And I, I would say that this is a projected fund balance because our po board policy governs not only the budget projection, but also where we actually land on the fund balance. So for the projected general fund fund balance for fiscal year 21-22, we have four components, including the general fund contingency on page 230, 233 with a roughly $3.8 million. Revenue stabilization fund, page 285, roughly $11.6 million. And then the SIP, which stands for the Strategic Investment Program Fund, page 298, uh, stands at $11.3 million. And then also the projected actual underspending, because of what we budget is not what we execute to by dollar every year. And uh, that's just a nature that we're not supposed to go over budget. Um, and the anticipated saving in general for the county has been averaging around 6%. So we're using 6% as a projection of those savings in general fund and projected out to a 36.9, close to 30, close to 40, uh, close to $37 million worth of general fund fund balance. And then what our projected net revenue is $243 million. And that gets us to a projected fund balance percentage of 15.19%. Next slide, please. So this is a five-year projected fund balance view, which represents the percentage. You can see the 15.19 is represented in the column, in the dot uh, on the fiscal year 21-22. And then based on our projections, we should be navigating a little bit up and down depending on some of the future obligations on debt service and the different um, expenditures. We should be navigating up and down a little, a little bit within that range. But for the most part, we feel confident with the current financial plan to maintain the 15 to 20% fund balance requirement. Next slide, please. So this is the time we covered a lot of material and then we actually do have time for an intermission. And uh, our, we usually try to schedule for 10 minutes, but it's really up for the uh, committee uh, about how much do you need. Does everybody feel 10 minutes is, is okay? Does anyone prefer a little longer, a little shorter? All right, well, we'll break for 10 minutes. So on my computer is 624 right now. Let's recome in at 635. I'll give you everybody one extra minute just so we, we're kind of on that five time mark. So, all right, see, so I will see everybody at 635.
Okay, we're at 6.35, so I can see that uh, we have most folks back. We don't have a Caesar, Commissioner Willie, or Venkat on video yet. I uh, just want to do a quick check. It's uh, Okay, Venkat is back. Uh, Caesar, are you back? Yeah. All right. Um, great. So we're going to proceed next uh, with the next part of our presentation. Is so that, for fiscal okay? year... Is it okay if I ask a quick question from the previous of course, slides? Of okay. course. Um, I wanted to ask about the intergovernmental funding of 8% that was part of the uh, general fund. Is there an example of that? I just wanted to understand uh, what, what constitutes that. Yes, ab absolutely. So for intergovernmental, it's the funding that we receive from other governments. And honestly, the county has a very close relationship with getting state grants or federal grants. And uh, sometimes those are direct allocations. Now, the, um, the, take the CARES Act CRF fund, for example. It didn't land in general fund, but it would be one example of uh, what an intergovernmental uh, revenue source is. Okay. Thank yep. you, Jeff. Yep. All right, so we are going to proceed with our functional area. Uh, budget presentation, which breaks down into each one of the solicited functional areas, the general government, public safety and justice, land use and transportation, housing, health and human services, culture, education, and recreation, and there are non-departmental, capital, and non-operating. And I'll pass it on to Sia to get us started with the general government. Well, good evening again, everyone. Thanks for being here. I, um, I get to lead us into the first of um, several dives into the department specific budgets. And we're gonna start with general government. This includes two sides. One is the direct services side uh, that includes budgets such as the uh, board commissioners, elections, office of equity, inclusion, community engagement. The other side is support services. And that includes units you can see here, such as emergency management, finance, risk management fleet. Um, and I'm gonna be looking at both sides of this budget. Um, Jack mentioned the new program lines for COVID response and recovery, which is one of the units in this section. And you can see by the pie chart on the right that our COVID response currently represents over a third of the general government budget there in green. Um, you'll also see, if you look down to the change box um, that Jack referenced uh, on the bottom left hand of each of these overview slides is that change box that, that Jack rec uh, was talking about a little earlier. On the direct services side of the budget, we're seeing about a $2.8 million increase um, or 11%. And I'll, I'll go into some details here about what that is made up of. The more significant change, of course, is in the support services um, side of the budget, where we see a $75 million decrease. And again, this is due to the COVID budget that Jack mentioned a little earlier. And we'll show you that here in a minute. Absent the COVID response and recovery budget, the rest of support services um, uh, increases just 4% or 2.3 million. So that's just an important note. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with the direct services side of the government, uh, of the uh, general government area. We're gonna start with the county administrative office. Now this is on page, for, uh, for those of you who have hard copies, this is on page 52 to 53 um, of your hard copy book. And I'm gonna highlight some of the changes that you're gonna see in these um, organizational units. Uh, starting with the county administrative office, there is a $75,000 placeholder in this budget that's new this year for redistricting activities once census numbers are released. There's also $500,000 in this budget for workforce pipeline work with Work Systems Inc. It's a pre-apprenticeship pre training program. Um, there was some conversation with the board around board priorities and courthouse planning costs that were discussed there are not included in this budget, but will be considered as part of a potential fall supplemental budget process. Um, one note about the Board of Commissioners budget, um, I don't have it here on the slide, but it's on page 51 of your book. Um, I wanna make a note about the salary commission 
Last November, uh, voters approved a change to the county charter that established an independent salary commission to determine salaries for the board of commissioners. Now the salary commission has completed its work, but this budget was put together before that work was completed. I wanna let you know that there is a placeholder amount of 295,000 in this in the board of commissioners budget and it is sufficient uh, to cover the uh, salary commission's direction on that. Next, uh, talk a little bit about county council and that's on page 54 of your budget book. And here you're gonna see one new attorney added for uh, to address increased workload in this unit. And this is in addition to um, increased cost for uh, an attorney added last year, well, current year, fiscal year 2021 as well. Next, assessment and taxation. And that's on page 57 of your budget book. For those of you who are following along, um, the assessment taxation includes one new FTE to support um, a transition, a multi-year transition they've been going through uh, for the, a new tax software system called the Orion system. And so there's a new FTE in here to support that uh, new tax software system work. Also, our Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement is on page 59 to 60 of your budget book. You'll see that one includes um, an additional $460,000. Um, and what you're seeing is full year costs for um, new FTE that were added last year. And this is to continue to support the implementation of the resolution approved by the board last year. Uh, you'll see continued support um, for community engagement activities in this budget from the lottery program um, as in previous years, 350,000 from the lottery program goes to support community engagement. Next slide. Now we turn our attention to the support services side of the budget. And um, I'm just gonna uh, highlight two pieces here. One, a quick mention, um, risk management on page 70, saw a mid-year addition in our current fiscal year of one new FTE for a risk investigator that was approved by the board, approved by the board. So you see full year costs uh, of that FTE in risk management. But the big news here is, as uh, Jack and I have both mentioned now, is the COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund, Fund 155. Um, as Jack mentioned, we're only um, partially appropriating funds right now. So that's why you see an expenditure drop year to year of 77 million. Um, we appropriated in 2021, 127 million, and this budget only includes 50 million. Um, for now, this budget um, anticipates revenue from American Rescue Plan Act, uh, emergency rental assistance, FEMA, uh, funding sources like that, but they're not fully recognized yet. So the most important piece of the budget that's currently here for 50 million is the continuation of 28 limited duration FTE that were added under the emergency declaration in this current fiscal year and are continued for our emergency response. Um, into the next fiscal year. It also includes some placeholder amounts, um, 1.5 million for uh, potential revenue loss and uh, 1.7 million for potential homeless response subject to board uh, direction. But as Jack mentioned, there is an expected need for a fall bu supplemental budget adjustment on this one. So. Um, and with that, unless there are any questions, I will turn it over to Aaron for public safety and justice. Thank you, Sia. The functional area of public safety and justice, which starts in your printed budget book on page 80, includes the sheriff's office, the district attorney's office, community corrections, juvenile services, the law library and justice court. And Conciliation Services operates as an arm of the Juvenile Department, and I'll talk more about each of these service areas relative to budget and key initiatives in the following slides. This slide illustrates the total amount of proposed budget and includes the general fund, then it delineates the special fund categories as the Public Safety Local Option Levy, the Enhanced Sheriff Patrol, Patrol District, or ESPD, and then other special funds. You can see that the special funds total roll up on page 80 of your printed budget book on the public safety and justice budget overview page. You'll note here in the top graph that the local option levy will increase by 4% over last year. 
This budget reflects year one of the new five-year cycle of public safety local option levy, which was approved by voters in May of 2020 to start July 1st of this year. The total amount of proposed budget for this functional area is $218,014,829. And as Jack mentioned, this is a total increase of 1% over the previous fiscal year and reflects increases in salaries, health benefits, and retirements primarily. The total increase in FTE for public safety and justice is 5.6 FTE, and so five of those positions are funded by the public safety levy and were specifically included in the levy plan that was described in the ballot language. And I'll mention a bit more about those positions as we move through the slides. Um, Again, the added FTE represents a 1% increase. So the small chart at the bottom of the slide conveys the budget dollars for each service area, and then the pie chart breaks down the percentage of total by each department. The Sheriff's Office is making up 62% of the budget, Community Corrections at 12%, the District Attorney's Office at 10%, Juvenile is 8%, and then the Local Option Levy Administration is 7%. And this organization unit includes funding to several emergency shelters, for urgent sheltering needs and other related services provided to community members, which includes victims and survivors of domestic violence. It includes funding to the Washington County Family Justice Center. And then new this budget year and levy cycle are services that will include a housing navigator and an employment specialist. And these two FTE will be shared between the shelter system. It also includes an addition of a 10 unit sojourners model of rapid rehousing for victims of domestic violence that will include rent assistance and case management services. And that chart and service breakdown can be found in the printed budget book on page 121. And then finally in the pie chart, the justice court and the law library together make up 1% of the overall budget. In the next slides, I'll provide a brief overview of each department and service area. Next slide, please. Uh, Starting with the Sheriff's Office, as the board and likely this committee and the community knows, the implementation of body-worn cameras is underway. Full deployment is anticipated to be completed or near completion close to the start of this fiscal year. The Latino Advisory Commission is a newly established program with Washington County's Latino community and other communities of color. Shared goals include addressing relevant public safety issues, providing the opportunity to deepen relationships and foster partnerships, and incorporate the commission's feedback into Sheriff's Office operations. Last fall, the Sheriff's Office initiated a review of its use of force policy and entered into a contract with Polis Solutions to review training, protocols, and review of use of force incidents. This assessment is scheduled to wrap up later this month, and it is anticipated there could be recommendations that may lead to organizational adjustments. At completion, there will be a report to the Board of County Commissioners, as well as a community presentation provided. Washington County Sheriff's Office proudly became nationally accredited on July 1st of 2004 by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, or CALEA. In 2020, they received an accreditation for the sixth consecutive time. Over this past year, the Sheriff's Office staff have worked tirelessly to effectively operate and manage a reduced adult in custody population to mitigate potential impacts of COVID-19 exposures in the jail. This work impacted the public safety continuum and highlighted the partnerships and collaborative efforts made to ensure that both public safety and public health were as balanced as possible. In this budget relative to the jail, the Sheriff's Office will be adding two jail deputies as part of the public safety local option levy plan. In this budget, there's an addition of an interagency contract to support the mental health response team. And this is just one service in the continuum of behavioral health and crisis services offered in Washington County. The Sheriff's Office requested an increase of six FTE patrol deputies to keep up with the population additions commensurate with the officers per thousand formula, and those were not added to this budget. So in keeping with some of the information you've already heard around in the budget message around um, ongoing costs and one-time funding sources, this is a continued conversation that we'll be having in the fall. Next slide. In a typical year, the district attorney's office processes nearly 12,000 cases annually, serves more than 12,500 crime victims, obtains court orders for more than $5 million in victim restitution, and collects over $35 million in child support obligations. The DA's office has met reduction targets, which continues to stretch resources to meet workload demands. 
The concept of a cold case detective was mentioned at last year's budget meeting, but it was not funded as part of the budget. However, in good news, the district attorney's office was awarded a federal grant to pursue cold case investigation in partnership with the sheriff's office, and that program is already underway. The revenues from the Victims of Crime Act, or VOCA, grant are projected to decrease by 10% this year. And this means victim advocate positions will not be filled as they become vacant. The DA's office continues to be a statewide leader in the use of specialty courts and treatment programs. And examples of these evidence-based programs can be found on page 25 of the budget book under trends and initiatives. It's probably no surprise to anyone that digital evidence continues to increase and be a focus area for the district attorney's office. The increased number of cases involving phones, cloud storage, and other digital materials can place a strain on resources, and the addition of body-worn cameras, not only for the sheriff's office, but also for cities within Washington County, will add additional workload to existing staff. The DA's office did request two FTE additions to support the increase in the body-worn camera workload from the sheriff's office, but those were not added to this budget, and again, in the evaluation of ongoing uh, cost that will continue to be evaluated in conversations this fall. There is one FTE edition in January of 2022 for a deputy district attorney four, which is funded by the local option levy and was created to handle the increase in workload of domestic violence and child abuse cases. Next slide. The topic of community corrections, which has already been a question tonight. Uh, the state funding has been an important one, both locally and at the state and legislative level. The state has continued not to fund community corrections at the rate set by the statutorily required actual cost and time study, or ACS. That occurs every six years and was last completed in 2018. The state funding supports the supervision, sanction, and service level of the felony caseload, and the general fund supports the misdemeanor caseload. Over the past several years, the misdemeanor caseload has continued to increase, which has put more pressure on the general fund. And in this next budget year, the general fund transfer increases by 478,000 in order to maintain the current service level for the misdemeanor population. Now, historically, the county has chosen to apply the same funding method methodology for state funded felony cases that's adopted by the legislature. However, in doing that, we're also therefore underfunding our own misdemeanor services. But it's further complicated because if we did follow the actual cost study, we would then create a funding and service differential between felony and misdemeanor classifications within the county. So this topic, while complicated, will likely need more policy conversation with the board moving forward while we simultaneously watch the state budget come to fruition. And because the state budget isn't finalized, we do know the current level of proposed funding will have a significant impact on services. It's forcing some key decisions not to fill positions, to reduce temporary staff, to reduce the number of dorms or beds available in the community correction center, and a reduction in contracted services for housing and treatment and polygraphs. The general fund will, or the general fund increase will allow the ability to maintain the service level for the misdemeanor population under supervision. This budget also plans for the addition of two FTE, a parole and probation supervisor and a parole and probation officer two, which is funded by the public safety local option levy. Next slide, please. The juvenile department has worked to meet budget reductions by balancing public safety with best practices and serving youth and families in the community. Washington County contracts with Multnomah County secure detention at the Donald E. Long Detention Facility in Portland. And as part of the efforts to meet reductions, they've reduced bed capacity from 17 to 14 beds. They were able to take some of the savings beyond that reduction and invest those dollars in current contracts that provide culturally specific services to youth and families and include family navigator services and other services that support the risk and needs and developed case plans of the youth in our community. The juvenile department will be implementing a new best practice program to develop contracts with community-based agencies to work with youth referred to the juvenile department. They'll do assessments and provide services that will match specific risk and needs to the appropriate service level. The strategy is effective in providing services and works to prevent further involvement in the juvenile justice system. And this program is also funded by the public safety local option levy. Next slide, please. Conciliation Services operates as an arm of the juvenile budget in partnership with the circuit court when children 
are included in domestic relations conflicts. And so they provide counseling and mediation services to individuals in the process of dissolving their marriages. Conciliation is funded by the Oregon Judicial Department or OJD, and the state appropriation has not increased in a decade, yet staff and program costs continue to increase. There is statute that allows some funds allocated from, the, from OJD to the law library to be diverted to conciliation services. And for a number of years up until this, this current fiscal year, um, Washington County had utilized a funding formula that diverted 10% of law library funds to the conciliation services. So 60% of the total would go to conciliation and 40% of that total would go to the law library. But due to state funding issues with both conciliation and the law library, the Board of County Commissioners made a policy decision to return to the state appropriation without the funding formula, and this budget year reflects that. The policy decision will be revisited as we look ahead to the following budget year and learn more about the direction of state funding. In the meantime, conciliation is operating as lean as possible to meet budget targets, and they eliminated a half-time uh, FTE conciliation counselor position. They're also doing some cost sharing with uh, duties of a conciliation counselor in partnership with the Juvenile Department Shelter Evaluation Program. And any future funding reductions or even status quo appropriations could impact FTE and service delivery. Next slide. The Law Library was established in 1926 and works to provide equal access to justice by ensuring legal information, resources, and tools are available and accessible. Operationally, over the last year of COVID, this has looked like many hours of remote services provided by the three FTE and in-person services whenever possible commensurate with the governor's risk levels. The law library is also funded by the Oregon Judicial Department and funding has remained flat or actually decreased over the last decade and included a decrease this current fiscal year, while staff and program costs have continued to increase. Overall, the law library revenues increased due to receiving the full state appropriation and due to the policy decision of the board to return to state appropriation without the funding formula shared between law library and conciliation. The budget was developed in the context of the original state appropriation from fiscal year 2019 to 2020. And the law library continues to draw on reserves to maintain just the current service levels. Um, and again, any future funding reductions or kind of status quo appropriations could impact FTE and service delivery. So we'll continue to keep an eye on this. Next slide. And then Justice Court. Washington County Justice Court is the last of four justice courts in the state and was established in 1915. It is the only court administered by the county and provides services in connection with civil and criminal actions. The court is administered by an elected justice of the peace. There has been a downward trend of citations issued over the past five years. Although interestingly, the average amount per ticket has increased, but the decline in citations has impacted overall revenue. There are continued discussions and work being done in this area. The diversion program stays steady with about a 25% enrollment in lieu of regular assessment of fines. The Justice Court has maintained fairly regular business operations throughout the pandemic, ensuring safe physical distancing and other recommended COVID protocols and have conducted many hearings, including small claims trials remotely when possible. I think I will turn it over to Ruth next. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Ruth Osuna, and I'm going to present land use and transportation. Um, we have a proposed budget of $117 million, which is a 10% decrease overall. Within the land use and transportation budget, or as we call it LUT, there are 13 organizational units dedicated to addressing growth while managing issues of community livability, the environment, and maintaining the quality of life. Overall, the LUT expenditures decrease compared to the current year, and this is the third year in a row that the LUT budget has decreased. LUT is primarily supported by the road fund. As you can see, 71% of the budget comes from the road fund or 83.6 million, along with taxes, permit fees, and state funding. General fund provides funding for long range planning 
and code enforcement to the tune of just under $400,000. LUT's revenues have been impacted by COVID pandemic, a slowdown of development and reduced fee revenue. Staffing levels continue to decrease in current planning and building services. Staffing in current planning is now lower than at the lowest point of the Great Recession. We began this journey last year and we continue to manage our expenses very aggressively as revenues have been uncertain. Next slide, please. Long range planning, this division's proposed expenditures increased by $750,000 or by 18% due to an expected phased in multi-year grant for Council Creek. Uh, Council Creek Trail and consulting services associated with community development code audit. Because of decreased revenues in current planning, long range planning has absorbed some current planning staff capacity to assist with this division's long range planning projects. The general fund subsidy for this division stays relatively flat with a slight increase of $2,000, just a little over $2,000. The road fund, which I stated earlier, is the largest revenue fund the, for the LUT. The road fund includes five organizational units, including engineering services, administration, road fund administration, capital project management, and operations and maintenance. The road fund has been impacted by the pandemic related to reductions in state highway revenue apportionment, vehicle registration fees, and the countywide one cent gas tax. We are proceeding into the next fiscal year with caution, with an anticipated continued decrease in revenues of approximately 5%. Expenditures decrease to 83 million or 12%. LUT is managing the reduction in the largest revenue source, the road fund, by managing vacancies and delaying some road maintenance and improvement activities. The contingency decreases slightly, um, but retains a healthy balance to maintain flexibility in the event of an emergency. On page 141, you see um, engineering services, which is also funded by the road fund. The number of personnel stays the same. Um, the biggest decrease in revenues is in charges for services, which is primarily due to an expected continued slowdown in the fee supported revenue review of engineering plans for development projects. Expenditures decreased by $407,000 and the road fund subsidy decreases by $302,000. In the capital manage, project management area, which is on page 147, the capital project services division is housed in primarily the road fund with staff costs are reimbursed for work on capital projects in the amount of 8.6 million. Most of the expenditures are for personnel. However, there is a 37% increase in expenditures for materials and services for systems improvements to the construction pavement software to evaluate the current quality control processes and an interdepartmental charge for project management software to improve tracking of project aspects such as design, permitting, schedules, and budgets. There are now eight vacancies in the capital project services area with recruitments in various stages in unanticipated, any unanticipated developments in capital project activity will be addressed by using professional service contracts with consultants. Turning to page 149, talk about operations and maintenance. On page 150, 
The total expenditures are approximately 33 million, which is 10% lower than this current year. The division manages pavement overlays and a variety of road maintenance activities and projects. The road fund is the, prim is the primary source of revenue for this LUT work group. Other revenue is received from permits and interfund transfers, primarily from staff support of the urban road maintenance district. There is a 20% decrease in materials and services primarily to maintain an adequate road fund balance due to the COVID-19 related downturn. This reduction is not expected to negatively impact overall county road conditions. The budget proposes no staff increases and currently work distribution is approximately 41% contracted and 59% non-contracted work. On page 154, you can, uh, next slide please. On page 154, we'll begin to discuss current planning and building services. The proposed budget reflects a cautious approach to revenue estimates as we anticipate continued limited development activity. Both current planning fund 172 and building services fund 174 are special revenue funds where fees are expected to cover almost all operating expenses. Most activity levels during the, this past year have continued to drop. Going into the current year, we began planning for this trend by aggressively managing expenses through holding positions vacant, voluntary furloughs, and employee transfers to other LUT work groups. Of concern in the, is, the, is that this division's fund balance continues to decrease. The proposed budget reflects a 40% decrease in in its beginning fund balance going into next year. At this rate, there is concern that the FY22-23 budget may not be able to sustain the current planning staffing levels if revenues do not improve. The $500,000 in operating transfers in is a one-time revenue source from fund 155 which is the American Rescue Plan, and which is this division will be dependent upon to maintain current staffing levels and service levels. Without this funding, the fund balance would decrease to um, about $600,000. Building services on page 157 of your budget book. Similarly to current planning, building services is also fee supported. Fee revenues are decreasing due to the slowdown of developments, and the current reserve fund is being depleted at a rate of approximately $235,000 per month to cover expenses. On page 157, there is a $1 million amount shown in operating transfers in. This is a one-time revenue source from fund 155, which is the American Rescue Plan. Again, we are counting on this funding source to take us through this next year. The division will be dependent on this funding to maintain current staffing and service levels. No fee increases are proposed to cover any of the operating costs for current planning and building services. The LUT budget includes funding for an assessment to evaluate future financial sustainability for both of these divisions. Next slide. Any questions on LUT before I go into the next functional area? Okay. I'm holding on to the mouse so tight, I can't turn the pages. <laughs> okay, let's talk about 
Housing, Health and Human Services. This area has had a lot of growth, new and new programs. Overall, many of the Housing, Health and Human Services organization units have been impacted by the COVID pandemic. Many HHS staff have been at the forefront of addressing community needs to respond and address the impacts of the COVID pandemic. Employees in this organizational unit, like so many throughout the county organization, have worked tirelessly to meet the needs of some of the most vulnerable communities throughout the county. Public health staff have continued to manage through a very fluid situation as our understanding of the COVID-19 virus evolved and as well as the response to it, such as social distancing, masking, educating, learning, and vaccinating. Equity has been a centering point for this group as it has tried to reach the most vulnerable, the houseless, the elderly, veterans, and black, indigenous, Latino, and people of color. The total budget for all of these areas is $250 million, of which approximately 31 million is funded by the general fund and the remaining approximately 21.9 million is funded by special funds from federal, state, and, and, and grants. Total of all organizational units include, the total number of employees for all of these units is 434 in the proposed budget, which is an increase of two positions. The inclusion of 16 new positions for the Supportive Housing Services Program are reflected in the current 2021 modified budget. While there has been some growth in housing, health and human services areas, overall the proposed budget reflects a 5% decrease of about 12.2 million. This decrease is primarily due to better estimating the funding needed to support the development of new affordable housing units with the Metro Affordable Housing Bond Program. Included in this functional area is the new Supportive Housing Services Program, which, fully, which will fully launch in July, and the county begins to re receive approximately $38 million in its first year. On page 165, you'll see large changes in the proposed budget. There is a 53 million decrease in the Metro Affordable Housing Bond Program and 37 million decrease in the Supportive Housing Services area. And I'll explain those big shifts later in these respective areas. Next slide, please. Public health. Under public health, there are 10 programs which include enforcing all Oregon public health laws, managing the local public health modernization plan, and public health authority. All 10 programs are funded by the general fund. Washington County's response to COVID is being led by the public health group and supported by many of the organizational units included in this budget and throughout the county organization. Total expenditures for public health are 24.3 million, which is a 1% increase over the current year. In the current year, public health implemented a new nurse home visiting program called Family Connects. This year's budget includes implementing billing to commercial insurance plans for home visits. This is reflected in charges for service as an increase of 5%. The proposed budget continues to support school-based health centers and continues to support the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program, which oversees public health emergencies. On page 173, you'll see um, animal services. This is supported by the general fund. The general fund subsidy increases by 2% or approximately $24,000. This past year, a donation fund was set up to track contributions and the donation revenue is now recognized in fund 154, animal gifts and donations. 
must spend a little time on development disabilities and behavioral health, which you can find on page 179. First, development disabilities. Washington County received from the state of Oregon to operate a community development disabilities program. This program has continued to grow as new community members were deemed eligible for services. But as case loads have gone up, staffing has not been able to keep up. Currently, the county, in addition, is has, has been adding an equivalent of one FTE in case loads every two months. Currently, one case manager carries an average load of 70 cases, and the state standard is 1 to 45. And this is not sustainable if the county does not see an increase in funding by FY 22-23. This division may see a case ratio of one case manager to 90 cases at a minimum or even worse case scenario and we may have to reduce case management staff and not be able to meet the needs of those individuals seeking services. This basically means reduced ability to provide services to the community and our case managers are not able to provide an acceptable level of customer service. Given the program's growth and the need to call out the sp specific budget challenges faced by this program, the Development Disabilities Program was separated from behavioral health and became its own division on July 1st, 2020. To effectively serve community members, the division has determined it needs to increase staffing using carry forward dollars. While the plan was to add two additional case management staff this past fiscal year, increased administrative overhead expenses and the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in the Development Disabilities Division freezing those two positions. The increased carry forward is currently reflected in Fund 191 due to the hiring freeze in, during this current year and savings created by the vacant positions. In this upcoming fiscal year, staff will be exploring various strategies to determine how to navigate the situation. As a reminder, just the other day, the board heard discussion regarding HB 3116, which would require the State Department of Human Services to make recommendations for a new funding structure, but nothing that these recommendations would not come before the state legislature or until the 2023 legislative session. Behavioral health on fund, uh, excuse me, on page one, 181. Fund 192. Historically, the name of this fund was Human Services. This is the first year this fund will assume its new name, Behavioral Health. The fund supports the Community Mental Health Program, Children's Behavioral Health, and Alcohol and Drug Services. These community-based services include crisis response, jail diversion, indigent treatment, care coordination, residential services, and system management. The fund has developed a sizable balance of over $5 million. However, a large portion of the fund balance is reserved for specific use, such as development supportive services to address homelessness among individuals with significant behavioral health needs. The Behavioral Health Division's budget supports operations and overall management but also contains funds that are held for specific use, including marijuana tax dollars. The marijuana tax dollars were used this current year to purchase the Clackamas County's half of the Tigard Recovery Center. Washington County is now the sole owner of this property. As mentioned earlier, on July 1, 2020, Development Disabilities became its own division. Fund 192 now supports the Behavioral Health Division, and within what Fund 192, the division held $500,000 in interest revenue to contribute toward new programs to support individuals with behavioral health needs or who are houseless. And currently, 
The department is, the divisions are exploring partnerships with housing services to invest in projects that support the needs of homeless individuals with mental illness and, and addiction needs. The fund also continues to hold approximately $500,000 in marijuana tax money. And these funds are reserved for specific projects developed for substance abuse, excuse me, substance use services. The division is partnering with housing services to develop permanent supportive housing for individuals beha with behavioral health conditions and the Center for Addictions Triage and Treatment. Next slide, please. Community development. This office manages the federal programs of community development block grant program and the emergency solutions grant. It manages these two programs on behalf of the urban county and its nine city CDBG consortium members. The proposed budget includes a small increase of general fund to expand fair housing and ec economic employment initiatives to advance equity priorities. The housing production fund Is, an, is, new, is new for fiscal 2021-22. This replaces the Affordable Housing Development Support Fund or Fund 100 on page 167 and creates a new fund 245. Earlier this calendar year, the board formalized an annual commitment of $4 million in general fund for five year, for five years, for a total of twenty million dollars to further the goals of housing product, affordable housing production, and to expand the guidelines to provide assistance for affordable multifamily housing assistance, a home ownership program, and innovative special needs housing programs that address what we found in the consolidated plan. The FY twenty twenty. Excuse me, the FY, FY 2021 22 proposed budget of 7.9 million reflects the third year of the five year commitment. Additionally, the administration of HPOF will be moved from the county administration office to the Office of Community Development. Going back to the home fund, um, which is managed also by the Community Development Office. Home Investment Partnership Program is, is a federally funded program through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Home funding is used to develop affordable housing through rental housing, new construction, acquisition, and or rehabilitation or home ownership. There are no impacts due to the COVID in the COVID program. However, in this current year, personnel costs in the home fund were shifted to fund 164, which is the community development block grant area for the next year to assist with emergency solutions grant COVID related work. The budget includes 4.7 million in other expenditures to fund two large projects, the SEPA Basalt Creek affordable housing development and the NH a Tigard Senior Housing Development. Each are funded at 1.2 million. I'm gonna call out the wood stove program. This is a small but mighty little program that we have, and we don't necessarily talk about it as much as we should. This has been a tough year for them. They've been impacted by COVID um, and the program has been put on pause, but yet they have persevered through this and are doing great work. It's this program is under uh, the air quality um, area on page 206 and 207. It's managed by the Office of Community Development and provides grants and rebates to eligible households to replace older wood stoves that contribute to levels of air pollution and public awareness and outreach regarding health, the health impact of wood smoke, particulate, and education on cleaner burning methods. 
This program relies primarily on grant revenue uh, to sustain itself. The program, the public support of this program remains steady, even in the current pandemic when the program had to hit a pause. The 30 suspended projects, and there were 30 suspended projects during this time period, but there was still interest because there is a current wait list of 60 applicants who um, would like to have their wood stoves replaced. Um, during this time when we weren't able to replace wood stoves, the staff uh, further its, its efforts to expand its partnerships and also to increase awareness of the program and educate the public. The enhanced and new targeted outreach efforts reached over 84,000 residents in Washington County. Next slide, please. The Affordable Housing Bond Program. This is under housing services. And over the past couple of years, the housing services program portfolio has grown significantly. In addition to the housing authority programs, this organizational unit incorporates the Metro Affordable Housing Bond Program and the Metro Supportive Housing Services Program. This is reflected in the overall revenues increase of, of a little over $3 million. General fund support for housing services and housing authority remains the same at 1.3 million. And these amounts include general fund operating support for the affordable housing bond program in the amount of $263,000. The affordable housing bond program or fund 219 houses revenue and expenditures for the Metro Affordable Housing Bond Program approved by Metro area voters in November of 2018. As we move into the next fiscal year, which will be the third full year of this five to seven year program, significant progress is being made to create affordable housing for seniors, veterans, people with disabilities and working families. Currently, 812 permanently affordable housing units are in various stages of development in 10 approved housing projects. This represents a leverage of $171.5 million to $99.8 million invested with bond funding. The county will recognize $415,450 in program administration revenue for fiscal year 21-22 and anticipates dispersing a little more than $31.6 million for project development to 10 projects that have been approved by Metro. We are watching the we are watching the expenditures of this program as this is the first year that we are investing general fund dollars. And we are expecting that the $415,000 that was received from Metro for uh, administrative revenue will be reduced by a little over $100,000 next year. Next, we have the Supportive Housing Services Program, Fund 221, which is on page 205. 204 and 205. Work has begun in preparation for the implementation of the Supportive Housing Services Program, which will launch in July when the first year's funding in the amount of approximately 38 million from two new 1% marginal income taxes uh, is received from the Metro tax distribution. There are, there are several departments across the county organization that are working on this new program. In preparation for this new program, the Board of Commissioners approved a general fund loan in the amount of $1.1 million and a supplementary budget in fiscal year 2021. The proposed budget includes the repayment of this loan to the general fund and the fiscal year 21-22 budget for includes 26 million to build a countywide system of care 
that connects all people with services and supports toward housing stability and equitable outcomes through strategic investments in these general areas, shelter and transitional housing, outreach and navigation services, housing barrier costs, and short-term rental assistance, regional long-term rental assistance, and supportive services. As I mentioned earlier, 16 new positions have been, are in the process of being hired or have been hired and are reflected in this fund and will be moved to fund 216. We are moving all of the uh, staff for the affordable housing bond program, the supportive housing services program to fund 216 in order to um, allow for a centralized management of these large programs. Any questions? Okay. Next functional area, please. Hey, hey Ruth, we do have a hand uh, raised by Commissioner Rogers. Yes. Hey, Ruth, have you got one more area you're covering? Just one little slice of it. But let me make a general comment and then I'll, I've been holding them. I, one, I wanna say thank you for your very candid presentation. Um, you, you mentioned on innumerable time at, at innumerable places in your presentation that uh, things are not sustainable, that there's gonna be a concern that we're relying on uh, CARES money. Uh, um, and uh, I, I like unvarnished kinds of comments like that because I share the concern. Um, and I've said that around the board table. I, I think that we're going to have significant issues. I, um, we can all, come to reasonable different conclusions, but I think inflation is gonna take off a bit. And I think our taxing structure in the state of Oregon with the total reliance on income tax is a problem. Um, we're seeing outward migration of wealth. Uh, there's a lot of issues that are gonna be faced. And so I'm gonna ask Jack, and it doesn't have to be tonight, but at some point, uh, yeah, how resilient are we in terms of, of uh, changes uh, that might occur due to either inflation increases or uh, other costs without dipping into that 15%. And so it's a, a big question and you certainly don't need to bore everybody else, but I, 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 I am concerned uh, with exactly what Ruth has been pointing out in terms of state revenues that are not keeping pace with mandated services, CARES money that can't go on forever, we'll go broke as a country. Um, and with a limited amount of, uh, of uh, the opportunity to get any other revenue sources because of our state dependency on the, the income taxes as major source of revenue. So a lot said, but I, I just want to say, uh, Ruth, I appreciate your uh, being so straightforward. It's uh, oftentimes in budget meetings over many, many years, people really are saying we're managing and they're gun ho to get through to the next level and say, we're, we're gonna do it, but that may be for one year. How about years two, three, four, five out? And so I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. If I may add, it's throughout our financial planning process, I should say, not only looking at one year's budget, but really looking at the production, the sustainability of our business models has always been on the mind. And then we do ask those questions. It's not necessarily um, in certain areas, we do have to wait for the funding to show up a little bit, uh, the clarification of what uh, is going to be divided out, like the American Rescue Plan is uh, just one example. Um, but your, your point is very well taken. We do take sustainability, financial sustainability, and operational sustainability very serious in our planning effort. Next slide, please. Okay, cultural education and recreation. This functional area is on a page 209. On page 210, included in this section of the budget are eight organizational units. Overall, the budget for all of these units decreases by 1% compared to last year of a of the approximately total amount for this area, excuse me, for this area, 64.5 million, 
Washington County Cooperative Library Services represents the largest budgeted amount of 54 million or 84% of the budgeted amount. Of the four point, um, there are 4.5 uh, new positions that are being requested in this area. So I'm going to, to speak a little bit about Washington County and then I will turn it over to Sia. Uh, Washington County Cooperative Library Services begins on page 216. Before I begin to talk about um, the cooperative services, cooperative library services, I'd like to um, just highlight an excerpt from the governing magazine online. A Gallup poll published in January of 2020 found that the cultural activity that Americans engage in most often wasn't going to a movie theater, concert, or a sporting event, but visiting a library. The most frequent users of library services were young people aged 18 to 29, residents of low income households and women. By March, 2020, 98% of all libraries had closed their buildings to some extent, a survey by the American Library Association found. Quickly, libraries pivoted and were working to augment online services and develop new ways to serve their communities during the pandemic. This describes WCCLS. They have quickly pivoted during this time and they have led our partner libraries in this effort. So moving into FY21-22, we're anticipating the same increased level of visits, and I say visits, Understanding that these visits are now virtual, primarily accessing ebooks and other digital collections. In this current year, patron usage of digital collections increased 37%. Streaming video through Canopy use, usage surged 96%. And approximately 30,000 students who adapted to remote learning received youth access library cards. Because of the increased demand for information technology assistance, both internally and for partner libraries, one senior client services technician is requested in this budget. With the rapid demand for digital content and having the ability to maintain the current service level as committed to voters through June 2026, W. WCCLS's current provision of a variety of IT services to libraries across the county will be a strategic discussion in this year's review of intergovernmental agreements with partner libraries. The proposed budget includes 1.8 million for WCCLS network and IT services. A highlight of this current year was the May 2020 passage by voters of local option levy which Ms. Angie mentioned earlier. We were lucky to have 69% approval, demonstrating the strong support for the important services and programs provided countywide. The proposed FY 2021-22 WCCLS budget reflects total proposed revenues in the amount of $39 million, which is a 3% increase over the current year. The proposed increase in revenues in the amount of 1.2 million includes a projected 4% increase in property assessed value, therefore an increase, an increase in tax revenue of $646,705 and a 4% or a $890,000 transfer from the general fund. This is offset by a decrease in miscellaneous revenue of $279,000, which represents no investment interest income and elimination of overdue fines from the fee schedule. Overall, WCCLS total expenditures increased by 6% or $3.1 million over the current year's expenditures. This amount includes a 6% increase or approximately 1.7 million increase in expenditures for materials and services due to the rapid growth in patron demand for digital collections driven in part by the pandemic. 
And also included in the 3 million increase is a 3% annual operational increase for partner libraries as approved by the board for current intergovernmental agreements that are set to expire in June, 2022. The contingency amount of 13.5 million will be deployed over the cur current five-year levy that extends to June, 2026. However, the proposed beginning fund balance target as a proposed in the 2021-22 budget in the amount of $13.6 million will be part of the review of intergovernmental agreements in this calendar year. The one standalone library that the county operates decreases its budget by 204% or 12, $204,000 or 12%. This decrease represents the completion of the renovation of West Slope Library, which we're very happy is almost complete. And West Slope Library is requesting one new FTE as seen on page 219. And that concludes WCCLS. And I will pick up, uh, this is Sia Lindstrom again, or the uh, Interim Assistant County Administrator, and I will pick up the rest of culture, education, and recreation. Um, I bring us now to the County Fair Complex, and you can find that on page 222 of your budget book. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that this and our new Wingspan Event and Conference Center have faced significant impacts on both revenue and expenditure due to COVID. Um, you uh, will read in the narrative that um, there have been uh, both staff deployments and new staff positions originally planned that have been held vacant through this. Um, so fund balances for both um, while dropping are still um, uh, within target. So we are keeping a very close eye on that. There is a shared staffing model between the fair complex and the wingspan. Um, so one of the th shifts you'll see in this budget, in addition to the fact that they're um, holding some positions vacant and redeploying staff, um, as they start to bring staff in, they are also gonna be shifting janitorial services from a contract model to an in-house model. And that means they'll be adding two new FTE. Because it's a shared service model, one FTE falls um, within the fair complex budget and one new FTE for that janitorial service within the wingspan budget. So um, budget for the annual county fair is included in this budget at 1.2 million. And that was a budget that was forwarded from the fair board this year. Um, I know the fair board is having, over the last couple of weeks, has been having conversations about what this year's fair will look like. Um, Commissioner Willie is serving as the liaison, so I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that um, as that those plans move forward. There are no major capital improve, improvements planned um, this year. There is $100,000 allocated for unanticipated capital improvements that might emerge during the year. The ending fund balance does drop to 660,000. That is still within the target for this fund. The target is between 500,000 and a million dollars for this fund. Um, and that does include contingency for the fair, for capital improvements and for fair complex operations. Transient lodging tax. Um, COVID impacts in this fund are still uncertain, but more optimistic as time uh, progresses here. Uh, this budget does project a drop of $2 million down to $2.2 million, but we fully expect that um, a supplemental budget adjustment may be needed. Um, so that's on the revenue side. On the expenditure side for transient lodging tax, this uh, is the budget that does include support for the Washington County Visitors Association. So you'll see that written up in the narrative. Next slide, please. Event center operations. So um, this is a beautiful picture of our brand new wingspan event and conference center here at Sunset. Um, the opening was planned for July, 2020, but due to COVID delays, um, the opening was delayed. So our first ever event was held just last month, April of 2021. 
we do continue to see COVID impacts on both revenue and expenses, and we are managing those uh, COVID impacts. Um, we are, as with many things now, nimble and flexible as we see how uh, events will be coming back um, as, the, as, as we reopen our um, community. Again, this is a place where that shift of janitorial services in-house is adding an FTE. Um, there was a planned gain share transfer in fiscal year 2021 um, that happened that increases contingency here to 1.5 million, which is an important piece of support for um, this new wingspan uh, event and conference center. Next slide. Okay, parks. Um, a highlight from this budget is that there will be a new paddlecraft uh, rental service out at Scoggins Valley. Um, the revenue from the new paddlecraft rental business is expected to fully offset its expenses. We're also seeing a shift of one FTE to parks from facilities to help support the growing operational needs at Scoggins Valley Park. So, um, which is exciting. And um, I think we all have come to appreciate the importance of outdoor activities uh, to sustain us through COVID. So uh, glad to see that continued community support for the importance of Scoggins Valley Park. Extension services, this is OSU extension. And our um, Washington County continues to both uh, support their facility and to fund their programs, uh, to help fund their programs. So this is considered to be a, a fairly status quo budget for OSU extension this year. Uh, rec they recognized uh, the budget constraints that we're all facing. So um, similar to other um, guidance to other departments, they uh, did submit a budget with just a 5% increase. Um, we do continue to support their facility at 169th place in Beaverton, and we are accounting for that a little differently this year, and accounting for those costs a little differently. Instead of housing it in this budget, we will now um, shift it to become part of the county cost allocation plan. So you'll see that change in the extension services budget, and that's on page 213. Metzger Park is the next one on page 214. And um, this current fiscal year, FY 2021, brought several capital improvements to Metzger Park. There was a long awaited sports court, a new HVAC system, and new roof for the Patricia D. Whiting Hall. So this next year, we'll focus uh, planning efforts on future capital projects. And that's going to be in partnership, obviously, with the uh, Metzger Park Local Improvement District Advisory Board. Um, because there are fewer capital projects this year, this budget sees a decrease. And next slide. Now we move to non-departmental. And there are three aspects of this budget. Um, the biggest is uh, contingency at 55% of the budget. Uh, community network there in blue is 21%. And then um, uh, aptly named non-departmental descriptive is at 24%. Uh, we see a most the most significant change in this budget here is that seven point, almost four million. 7.4 million in contingency. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with non-departmental. Non and this is on page 231 of your budget. This department holds various county memberships and professional services. Uh, the allocations are summarized on page 232, if you'd like to see the full list um, of those allocations in your budget book. It includes support for the Association of Oregon Counties, for the National Association of Counties, for the TriMet Passport Program to support our employees, and the Regional Arts and Culture Council. Um, so the support also continues here for um, $100,000 for the Board of Commissioners Community Allocation. 
that one continues on. Um, just a note, we have left this budget unchanged the last two budget cycles, except for small annual increases that come through every year for um, Association of Oregon Counties dues, for the Regional Arts and Culture Council, and for the Am Animal Damage Control contract. So just the small annual increases there, otherwise this budget is unchanged. Uh, next is a general fund contingency. And this holds one component of the general fund reserve. Jack went into this in quite a bit of detail in the beginning. So I'll, I'll leave this one um, at just one comment. And that's just that the general fund reserve is projected above the 15% of net revenue goal set by the board, by board policy. Uh, next, oh, we have a hand up. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Just a quick question. Is that animal damage control, that USDA contract? Yes, it <laughs> is. Thank you. It is. Um, yes, your board learned a little bit more about that through a recent constituent issue. And actually, we'll be getting you more information about that contract here. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's see. Next slide. Community network. Uh, this uh, continues support for almost $750,000 in funding for various community-based organizations. And you can find a full list of those allocations on page 235 of your budget summary book. Um, this also is one that has remained unchanged um, from last year. The only change is a $2,000 one, and it's for a minimum wage increase with the SummerWorks Youth Program with Work Systems. I also have a note here from uh, Latricia, from our equity officer, chief equity officer. Uh, she says, we've received board direction to develop a process for community investments that centers equity and that is more transparent about how investments are made and about expected outcomes. So while we don't see that reflected in this year's community network budget, uh, equity office staff is working on developing that process improvement per board direction. Um, so that's the community network. And with that, I will pat, we are done with, uh, with uh, culture, education, and recreation. I'll pass it along to Jack for facilities and technology capital. Thank you, Sia. Um, so I want to do a quick time and energy check. We're at 7.50. We don't have a scheduled intermission at this moment, but we can take an impromptu one if everybody likes one. Okay, why don't we take 10 minutes? It's 7.52 right now. We can regroup at 8.02. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hey, Jack, are you still there? He is He is not, Commissioner Rogers. Is there anything I can do for you? I think I'm sitting here in my office. I think I'm going to head home, and then I'll pick it up on my home. Uh, it's probably taking me about 15 minutes uh, or so. so okay, I, I will let them know. If, if I'm not there, uh, Pam has my permission to vote, um, however. <laughs> right. All right. All right. Goody, 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 goody. Yeah. <laughs> Jack, I'll be back in about 15 minutes. I'm going to leave my office, go home, and then pick it up at home. That's good. Okay. Thank, you, then. thank you, Roy. Thank so, you. our. Uh, Jack? Mm -hmm? This is Pam. I'm just curious. How late do you think we'll go? I think another hour, most likely. Um, we still have the capital side and uh, uh, the non operating side, and then also the service district for lighting. So, you so I think about another hour. You advertise till 8.30, and I've got an early meeting, so I probably will bug out if that's the case. So. Yeah, and I apologize, apologies, because every year the presentation kind of deviates a little bit. And uh, yes, we should reserve more time next year. And and we did all the community action already, so, so there won't be an action that's needed. So for our... Visual team, if we for the public's benefit, if we can roll back to the last intermission slide, which is slide number 17. And uh, that way the folks joining in on YouTube would not be wondering what we're all doing. <laughs> are you here, Chuck, Chuck or Michael? Yep, you got it. Awesome. Thank you very much.
So Jack, I had a question. Yes, uh, definitely. Um, do we know when the census data will come in, come in? Sia mentioned that there would be some adjustments pending that data. Do we do we know when it comes? You know, that's a really great question, which I don't have the answer to. Okay. I will follow up with our communication. Or, or looks like Chair Harrington might have something to add. So last I heard, they were Double looking. Oh, last I heard, they were looking sometime um, September. Oh. Catherine, you heard the same. Yeah. So then that means we pass this budget, and you make those adjustments later, obviously. So as part of the annual budget process is we have the adopted budget. And then the reason that we have a modified budget is throughout the year, there's three set times for budget adjustments, uh, which is, uh, you know, we have a statutory limitation on how much can be adjusted and uh, where are some of those adjusted is all a public process. So, so that's what uh, Kanya and Sia um, was referring to earlier, that there are still a lot of unknowns with, um, you know, associated with the federal fund that's coming in, still a lot of unknowns are how some of those funds will be administered by the state. So we will have a supplemental budget in the fall, which captures some of those unknowns. Yeah. And that's what the commissioners do, right? We don't, we don't do that. Correct. The money so that's allocated to that project is to study, to take that census data and do the study so that we can adjust our, our district boundaries following the requirements. Okay. But if you do a supplemental budget in the fall, that's something that the county commissioners do. We don't come back together as a budget committee. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, I think, Karen, that's a great question. And I think that is a question for the budget committee is if you would like to come back given that this is going to be a significant supplemental budget, I would not say it is um, a general annual operating supplemental. Um, and the reason that we would lift that to the budget committee to decide is when you signed up for the budget committee, you knew what the scope was. And so this was in essence, this would be out of the scope of um, when you initially volunteered. So we just want to be thoughtful of the time that you invest in this process as well. And the state statute does not have a budget committee participation process for the supplemental. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can't craft a county process. Um, but just so you know, we don't have, we don't have to go through all the legal, the, the approval step and the adoption step with a supplemental uh, process. Okay, okay. I'm just curious. <laughs> yep. All right, so uh, looks like that we have most folks back. We have Commissioner Whaley and um, Commissioner Rogers mentioned that he is going to transit from his office back home and continue. So he may need a couple extra minutes and he told us to start um, on the next part. So, <laughs> hey. oh, Caesar, your, your hand is up. No, I just, I would just say that my computer is overheating. So oh. if I, so just excuse me, if, if, if you ask a question, I don't respond, uh, so just, yeah, that's all. Okay, no problem. All right, so we'll get started with the capital budget. We have two more functional areas to go. Both are not operating. The capital is uh, one and the not operating is the other. So we'll start on the facilities and technology side of the capital budget. On this slide, you can see a summary of the facilities and technology budget, which includes seven different organizational units in various projects. Now we break it down into four categories. They include the emergency communication system, the Windspan event and conference center, facilities and parks, as well as the information technology. Now out of the four, the emergency communication system and the Windspan event center, event and conference center are standalone projects because it's the share size of this project. That's why we create a separate fund and then we highlight them as separate categories. And then this facilities and parks and the information technology actually both includes multiple projects, and uh, it's actually our holding fund for the general capital project needs in those areas. And uh, we'll move on to the next slide. We'll get started with the ITS, which is the technology capital project first. So this year's budget includes several multi-year projects 
which continues into this year, as well as we have new programs uh, lines that tracks infrastructure services, which includes new contingency in this um, budget as well. Now, one thing that I want to highlight is that uh, we are incorporating a lot of more, a lot of more um, modernizing the county type of projects, including a website redesign projects within the ITS capital, including looking at our um, aged enterprise resource planning software, which is a software that runs the county's operations as uh, in the background, um, looking into the replacement of that as well. So those are just a couple of examples of the modernizing our government to serve a modern community base um, as part of our infrastructure investment, as Tanya mentioned earlier. There are other examples. So for the ITS capital, we have a, a list of the categories and uh, some examples of the projects that is on page 245. And uh, that is PDF if you're using an electronic version, page 276. And then we'll move on to the facilities capital. So obviously, in addition, in comparison to the ITS capital, these are the buildings, these are the land, these are the parking lots, all of those capitals. So facility capital, one significant project that we included in this year's budget is actually the strategic facilities planning project, which is a major initiative that the county is undertaking to engage with the community and then build a future facility plan strategically based on the community need, staffing need, and all of the department's service, service delivery strategy as, as, as the center. And we also would like to incorporate the center equity and uh, inclusion as part of, the, um, part of the work that goes into that project. And then uh, for facilities, we also have a multi-year project that got carried forward, which is a part of the Wana Street seismic retrofit project is partially funded by Gensher, but also um, have other fundings that may come in to support that project. And then for, and then there is also a table that lists out all of the planned facilities capital project. On, uh, on the summary book, page 249, and PDF, page 280, uh, that explains each one of the projects that's covered under facilities capital project. Now, one thing I want to highlight is in the past, we haven't really uh, budgeted contingency uh, in these areas. Actually, contingency is even not exactly the most correct term. It's really in most other jurisdictions, they call them capital reserves. And that is something that we're starting to introduce this year, which is why you're seeing all of a sudden we didn't have contingency in last year's budget and this year we do. So those contingencies in both of these funds represents the amounts that we do not anticipate to complete by the end of the fiscal year, which gets we, which we anticipate to be carried forward into the next fiscal year and continue as part of the project plans. And next slide, please. So let's talk about the two major projects that's within the facilities and technology capital area. The emergency communication system, it's a, a project that is supported by a $77 million voter approved general obligation bond to fund the updates to the county's emergency communication system. Now we have, we are about halfway into that project and so far it has been a very successful project. We're seeing really good outcomes. And then we also have improvements to towers, to the microwave passes, to the digital radios. So it's not only the building uh, for the emergency communication system itself. It also includes all the technologies of modernizing, again, modernizing um, the infrastructure to support the modern community. And then we have the construction of the 911 center as a new facility. So both are those co components. And uh, that project in this year's budget, we, we did have some um, uh, unanticipated funding gap, which was covered in one of the previous work sessions with the board. And then in this budget, we are actually uh, building a financial plan to close that funding gap, which is why you're seeing a, a balanced budget in this in this budget. And the, for the funding gap, we actually included um, uh, two components, as 875,000 transfer from the, from the public safety levy uh, that's included as a, in, as a funding source for this fund. We also included a 600,000 uh, general fund loan in this uh, funding source. Now our deputy county administrator, Aaron Cobber is, um, 
uh, CEO representation on this um, project. I would like to see if Aaron has a comment uh, to add to this part. I don't have any additional comments, Jack, unless there's questions that may come up toward the end, but I think you've covered the information well. The project is uh, on this point on time and looking to close out or to be completed the first week of October of this year. Thank you very much, Aaron. And then we'll, we'll move on to the other one, which is the event center, the capital fund, which, which funds the capital project. And as all of you are aware, uh, now the event center is open and the building is operational. So there are still some small components of the capital project that's not quite finished, not necessarily um, directly associated with the building operations. So some of those components uh, includes, as an example, adding an automatic uh, fee boost and a, a parking gate for, for patrons to automatically pay the parking fee and enter the parking area. And other areas is to continue to work with the vendor to tune the equipment that's within the building. So it gets to an area where our staff feel comfortable to proceed with that. So all of those are examples of um, um, the event center capital project fund, but we're definitely in the closing out phase of that project as the majority of that project is complete. And then after, obviously, after all of those miscellaneous smaller components of the capital project finishes, we also do have a little bit of a funding uh, closing by either evaluating what to use for the savings from the event center, and then as well as uh, paying, getting all the bills that come in paid. So that's why it's uh, going into next fiscal year. Next slide, please. And then this is where I'll pass it on to Ruth to cover the transportation capital. Thank you, Jack. Um, I'm going to highlight. I'm going to highlight four areas. Um, total funding for this area is two hundred and nine million dollars. This is a thirty nine million dollar decrease primarily due to um, road fund and funding not being available. The traffic, the countywide traffic impact fee on page 255 fund 360 will be closed and will, this year and will be replaced by the transportation development fund or the TDT. The two final projects in this fund were completed this year and the remaining fund balance will be transferred to, T, to the TDT um, fund 374. Projects completed include the Cornelius Pass, Germantown, Old Cornelius Pass Road and Shoals Ferry, Shoals Ferry, Sherwood intersection. Um, next slide, please. Major street, uh, streets transportation improvement program, um, just over $123 million is budgeted for the what we call the MSTIP. This will fund 51 projects that are in various stages of development. And you can see the list of those projects on page 259. Overall, the LUT capital projects in the MST budget decreased approximately 4.5 million. Revenues decreased 7.1 million and expenditures decreased 4.5 million. The decline in revenue is primarily due to a reduction in intergovernmental re revenues because project revenue was received from jurisdictional partners in this current year, which was ahead of schedule. 15 million, which was planned to be transferred to the Transportation Development Tax Fund 374 from the MSTIP for the Southwest Corridor light rail project did not occur and capital outlay also is reduced since right of way acquisitions were completed this year. Road capital fund, uh, road capital projects. Um, you can see the list of these projects on page 262. Road projects include LUT road construction activities, bikeway and pedestrian bridges, gain share bike and pedestrian intelligent trans system. Total over 32 million. Um, the road, um, the total road capital projected expenditures decreased by 7.3 million due to some projects being delayed due to the impacts of reduced gas tax revenue resulting from COVID-19. 
19. The projected revenues for 21-22 are approximately 9.6 million lower than the previous year due to reduced funding about 1.5 million and transfers from road fund approximately 7.1 million due to project delays resulting from the reduced gas tax revenue. Um, transportation development tax, the TDT on page 263. TDT revenue shows a decrease of 15.2 million. Operating transfers are the primary reason for the reduction in revenues. A $15 million transfer from the MST for a portion of the TriMet's Southwest Corridor project to TriMet will not occur. Operating transfers reflect a decrease in funding from the road fund and delay in projects. And total expenditures are reduced by just over $22 million. That's it for me, Jack. We'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ruth. Next slide, please. So next, we'll jump into the non-operating area. Arguably, it's one of the more confusing areas of the country's budget. <laughs> so the non-operating covers a lot, actually, of the non-operating parts of the county, which is very essential to the county's operations, but sometimes it's not just apparent to the community. And I will dive into four categories, including the debt service of the county, the insurance and risk management, the miscellaneous, um, which we will cover what, what is under the miscellaneous, and then the replacement and reserve funds. So all of those, overall, the budget grew from 328 to 347 million, and uh, that is a 6% growth in these areas. So, and so we'll move on to the next slide. To start off with the debt service, we have three org units under there. We got the general obligation bond, theory 2016B full face and credit bond, and then the miscellaneous debt. So the similar theme as the capital theme is for the major ones, we actually create a separate fund for them. And that's why we have the general obligation bond, which covers the 2016 voter approved bond for replacement and upgrade of the 911 system. And that is the debt service for the bond that finances the emergency communication center's capital project. And then we have the series 2016B for face and credit. There are three project areas that is financed under this bond. Um, one, one is the event center. The Winspan uh, event and conference center is covered under this, partially covered under this, I should uh, clarify. And then we have the, a number of um, major street transportation improvement program that has been fun, financed by this bond. And then the last category is the general facilities infrastructure improvements that has done, which included the public safety building uh, seismic upgrade project. So that is the uh, serial 2016B for face and credit. And then we have the miscellaneous debt, which accounts for the debt issued prior to 2016 and then now accounted for in the previous two org units. So that, that's primarily two debts. We have a 2013 refunding of 2006 debt and then a 2016 refunding of the 2006 debt. You can actually find a table after the budget narratives, after the miscellaneous debt or unit to, that explains um, what are those debt finances. Next category um, and next slide. So we have the insurance and uh, that covers the liability casualty insurance, the life insurance, workers' comp, medical insurance, unemployment insurance, and per employee, uh, employer stabilization. So the first five categories is really common to both public sectors and private sectors. These are really the insurance that we need to carry as an organization, and then uh, we need to carry to cover the employee benefits. So the liability and casualty insurance, which is funded by the county's cost allocation plan, includes a new contingency, um, of $1.3 million. So uh, in this year, it's definitely worth starting to build fund balance in that just to cover the unanticipated settlements that may come to us. And then this, the contingency in this fund is determined by the actuarial um, determination. And that, that amount is about $2.1 million at 90% confidence level. So if you refer to the budget, we do not um, have that level of fund balance yet. So we are still in our building fund balance here for that fund to be covered at 90% actuarial confidence level. Life insurance, the contingency in this fund is uh, targeted to be one to two months of um, the expenditures, which 
in dollar amount is 40,000 to 85,000. So in this fund, we are actually um, right in the range of our target fund balance. And the next one is the workers comp, um, workers compensation fund. The fund balance target is also determined by actuarial estimate, and then it's about $900,000. So this is another fund that we're in the process of building fund balance, as well as um, um, trying to be very mindful of the countywide cost of this. Next fund is the medical, which is really our largest um, insurance fund that we have here. And uh, so for the medical, we also have a contingency started this year for five, for five million dollars. Our target fund balance is actually about 3.5 to seven million dollars. So the medical fund is right in the range of um, um, conservative reserve level, which represents for so that 3.5 to seven million dollars represents about one to two months worth of uh, operations, just in case we run into any um, sudden rate hikes or anything that's unanticipated. So the reserve is to cover those expenditures. And then next fund is the unemployment fund. The fund balance target in that one is 500,000, um, which is also um, in its building year. As you can see, our contingency is not quite there yet. Uh, our fund balance is 237. And then the target is 500,000 due to last recession's experience. Is normally we don't really need the reserve in this fund. But when we do need it, there's not, it's not going to get better you know, very quickly if the country does experience high unemployment. So that's why we need to have a, a rather higher reserve in that fund, higher in terms of a percentage um, in that fund. And then we have, lastly, we have the purse employer stabilization. Now this fund is a little bit, for lack of a better word, inactive at the moment. The country has utilized this fund to save up to invest in the purse side account. And uh, we have done that about two years ago. And then this fund currently is carrying this balance of 300,000 and then continue to carry it until the country come up with the, um, the next wave of strategies of controlling and maintaining our purse employer rate. So part of the, for our community members benefit, um, the public employee retirement systems rate is expected to continue to rise um, and then this fund is really just uh, for us to save some money to find strategies on keeping that rate uh, at a manageable level. Next slide, please. So now let's get into the replacement and reserve fund. We have a, a couple of different areas. We'll start with the revenue stabilization. This one is actually part of the general funds reserve and that, that is why it's in the reserve and replacement fund. I'm um, trying to navigate to the right page in my budget document. It's on page 285. And this is another one of those um, funds that doesn't have a lot of activities. And it's a very truly a reserve fund that we do not touch unless it's absolutely necessary uh, for us to touch the body of funding. Next slide, uh, not, sorry, not next slide. Next bullet point is the animal service and gift and donation fund. This folks may ask like, why is this a replacement or reserve fund? I, believe that there's some historical reasons that some of these gifts and donations are targeted toward uh, capital projects and uh, capital improvements for the animal services. So over time, it has morphed a little bit. It still has that capital improvement component in it, but it also has a component that supports operation um, in that. So, but for historical reasons and that component of the capital reasons, we're keeping this in the uh, replacement reserve fund this year. So for this one, you might notice that this year, the miscellaneous revenue is, uh, had a 582% increase, which is on um, page 286. And then that in dollar amount, that is 341. So what that is, is actually a change of accounting method. And as uh, described on the slide, is that we actually went through some discussions with uh, Ruth Sona from the county administrative office, with the folks at Animal Services, HHS Finance team, to talk about, you know, we've been doing a a really good job managing all of these donor funds with spreadsheets in the past. So this year, one improvement that we did is we actually formalized a departmental policy uh, for animal services, which resulted in this change of accounting method. So this new, this apparently new dollar amount that's coming in is actually not new at all. There used to be a portion of the donations that goes into, um, that doesn't get booked in this fund in, in a way, 
and then goes directly into animal services to support operations. So for transparency reasons, for policy and uh, management reasons, we ended up with a policy to say, okay, all donations will come into this fund. And then for the portion that is supposed to be used to support operations, it gets transferred to the operational fund, which is a part of the general fund org unit. And that is why you're seeing both an increase in the revenue in the miscellaneous line, as well as an increase in the operating transfers out. And that represents the operational support by donors uh, to the animal services. Next, next part is the building equipment replacement fund, ITS system replacement fund, and fleet replacement fund. So this ones are, I'll just explain the concept of this one. There are two replacement funds as well. So for building equipment replacement fund, that is one to cover like the county's the roofs, the elevators, the generators, any major equipment that actually is worth saving up for to replace. And then for the ITS system replacement, it's our, about our hardware, our softwares, our computers, our phones, our major software packages, systems. So that's where we save it up for the ITS system replacement. And then for fleet, of course, it's all of the county's fleet um, vehicles, no matter if it's uh, patrol vehicles or land use and transportation uh, road operation or maintenance vehicles. So that fleet replacement fund is um, where we are saving up to cover the replacements of those vehicles. Next slide, please. Now we're moving to the miscellaneous uh, category within the non-operating budget. That is on, starts on page 292 of the budget book and the PDF page 331. So we'll start off with the general fund transfers. This is another major component of general fund as a whole. So we talk about general fund at the beginning and in the book, there is actually a general fund section at the beginning. But when we get to the functional area, that's where general fund gets really segregated into a hundred different parts. And a hundred is just a rough number, but it's just in, in a lot of different organizational units. So essentially, <coughs> excuse me, the general fund transfers is a cash all organizational unit where it takes in, um, collects out of the county's discretionary revenue to the, under general fund that comes in there. And it also houses the general funds transfers out going into the special funds. And the difference with that is used to balance out the operational need in the other general fund organizational units. And that is where you see the res you see the line on 292 where it costs resources allocated to other units. And that line represents the resources allocated to the other general fund units under general fund. And uh, next slide, please. So for the lottery program, it's also one area where we take in the state money. So um, it's too bad that Venkat is no longer here. He had a question about, you know, what are some examples uh, of the intergovernmental revenues? This is a classic example of intergovernmental revenue. The state collect the lottery fund um, and then they allocate it and then share a portion with the local jurisdictions to promote um, really economic development type of opportunities. And then on page 296, we have a table that illustrates both the internal effort and external effort that we utilize this fund as a county to support economic development. I know there, as Tanya mentioned, we have our very first economic development manager uh, that's on board now. So we will be going through some strategy building and soul searching as a county on how to best utilize some of these dollars. Next slide, please. So the strategic investment program, and that is the program where the county takes in the state approved strategic investment program, meaning um, getting into agreements with some of the larger organizations that create jobs and stimulate local economies um, by having a different way of collecting taxes. And then we have currently have three separate SIP agreements. Two is with Intel, and then we have one with Genentech. The expected revenue is supposed to come in at $40 million, this, close to $40 million this year. And, and that's the combination of all three agreements. And then we are also budgeting $43 million transferring out to support general fund uh, operations to maintain that fund balance. So this fund will have a, a contingency of roughly $11 million, which will be carried forward for future operations. And it actually is one of the four components of the general funds fund balance. And then the next part is the gain share fund. 
and the revenue is expected to remain very fairly flat after the state has colored the maximum dollar amount of the gain share revenue. Um, our dollar has stayed mostly flat, and occasionally it decreases a little bit because a new taxing jurisdiction appears in Washington County or a new urban um, urban renewal areas uh, gets added. So 9.2 million dollars in revenue is what we're anticipating, and then we're budgeting. Um, 8.5, 8.6 million dollars with expenditures less the contingency, which is um, again the amount that we don't anticipate to spend, uh, which represents the projected ending fund balance, 3.2 million dollars for this year. And then last part of the miscellaneous is the indirect cost recovery. So that starts on page 301 in the printed book and 340 for the electronic version. This is another one of those purely pass through funds. So essentially it collects all of the internal revenues um, and then pass the revenues out to the service providers. So if you think of those internal services like our, um, like our general fund services, our fleet services, our facility services, um, maintenance, all of that is internal focused. And then different funds and different departments pay into that cost for all of that services. And this in indirect cost recovery fund is actually the pass-through um, holding place for this revenue to come in and then the transfers to the right uh, service providers for those areas. So the total budget in that area is $33.7 million this year. And that concludes the non-operating part. Uh, next slide, please. So that is the end of the county's budget presentation. And this is really the time for your committee um, to work together as colleagues and then have some discussions. And we will be happy to answer any questions that you have. So I have a question. Um, go, go ahead, Karen. There was a part where you gave the county commissioners $100,000 does that mean each of them gets 20 or they together decide where the $100,000 goes? Yes, so currently the county strategy is the $20,000 for each commissioner. And um, yes, and just a little historical, that was a part of our uh, strategic investment program for, for the first six years and that's the initiation of that. And then because it's such a good program and the county continued to carry that forward with uh, discretionary funding. All right, any other questions from the committee? I have one more. <coughs> uh -huh. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, you had mentioned in one of the slides about the new, the two new programs for affordable housing. One was for senior housing. Is there a place where I could read up on where that is and what that is? Absolutely. Um, Actually, I want to look to Ruth to see if uh, she wants to chime in on that. Actually, Karen, um, there were two programs. One is a supportive services um, program, and the other is the affordable, um, is the um, housing opportunity fund. And um, those aren't specific to seniors. I, they do support and build senior housing. So the best place for you to find information regarding senior housing is actually on the housing services website. Well, and if I can just add to that, Ruth, what we can do, um, Karen, um, just because these there are um, actually three programs, the affordable housing bond, the supportive housing services measure, and as um, Ruth mentioned, the housing produ production opportunity fund. So we can send that to the committee as follow-up information um, because this has been of great interest to many community members. I think it's the number one thing people are interested in. Chair Harrington, your hand is up. I just wanted to say that I submitted a bunch of questions in writing and I'm more than happy for those to be responded to in writing versus keeping us here longer tonight. Yes, we plan on doing so, um, responding in writing, yes. 
I, I have right. a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, Caesar, go ahead. <clears throat> so in the proposed uh, budget summary, it mentioned that the defund the police conversation over the past year was taken into account. But so I guess I say like, could you explain on how that was taken into account? Because it seems like the police budget, the police budget in general, seems like it was over. I don't know. It seems like it, it seems big in general, but it seems like the changes. I don't know. So I guess I'm not seeing where that was taken into account. So Jack, I can I can recite, and I see Erin turning on her camera too. Um, in the spirit of time, Caesar, because I think this is multi pronged mm -hmm. too. If we can respond to that in writing, um, that would be helpful, just from the spirit of time, and then happy. Oh, of course. Uh, too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I, 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 forgot, I forgot about the time. You're right. Sorry. Chair Harrington. Sorry, I'll wait till Commissioner Fye's done. Oh, Commissioner Fye. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I sh there you go. I raised my hand before you. Um, I think this is, um, it goes along with what Caesar was just asking and also conversations I've had some community members, um, concerns about our budget uh, that we published and how you know the county embarked on this journey to engage the community and to have conversations around community investment and to say get involved in the Washington County budget process and give us feedback and what you would like us to, to do different and um, and I think the community was very empowered and really participatory. Um, going back to the presentation that was done back in March or February uh, with uh, Elizabeth uh, from our staff from Washington County and Marcus Mundy and other community members um, was very robust process and very participatory and community gave a really strong feedback on what they like us to see different. Um, yet, some of the concerns from the community that I heard was around how that wasn't reflective of the budget that was you know, published. And I think um, that is something that Washington County is gonna need to respond uh, and to reconcile uh, the, the community investment conversations, suggestions that the community made and this budget that was put forward. And I, um, you know, engaged quickly with the chair, but I think this is something that we really need to um, respond. And in looking back to the, the memo that we sent to the community investment conversation participants, we did uh, reflect back the feedback that we got, uh, you know, such as uh, the request to decrease public safety and justice allocations. And what I think the, what the part of the message there was decrease here in order to increase support for mental health and behavioral health services. And we have made investments through this proposed budget uh, because if we hadn't made those investments, then we would have been further decreasing our mental health workers and behavioral health workers. So uh, through the highlight, I should have tagged the page earlier um, because when we were going through this, um, such as with developmental disabilities, we do have some additional staffing there uh, for our mental health services coordinators. So there are places in the budget where there have been some incremental ads. It may not come across as, as significant as some people would like. And I think many of us would agree with that, that yes, we would like to make more impactful investments in mental health 
services. But the problem is that our cost of salaries, um, uh, benefits, and uh, retirement cost coverage has gone up across the board. So part of our revenue is being used just to keep keep our workers doing the work that they're doing uh, versus being able to capture that revenue and put it into new program staff. So I agree with the sentiment wholeheartedly that it would be helpful if we're able to come back and highlight where we have been making those selective investments. Um, and you know, similarly with land use and transportation, uh, with the, the next round of MSTIP3, we just had a recent work session that talks about how we want to uh, have a more robust community engagement process uh, to include the public to make sure that those investments are, are going towards the kind of improvements that our community members are looking for. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to more of that information and, and also talking with our community more about that perhaps in some of our upcoming town halls. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Uh, any other questions from the community members? So I was just gonna make a comment and I have to told other people in the community the same thing. If you take that $1.4 billion budget and you divide it by 365 days in the year, and then you divide it by 660,000 people, it works out to $5.81 per person per day. So it's easy for people to swallow $6 a day more than it is for them to to swallow 1.4 billion. So I think when we talk to the community, we have to give context. Otherwise it's just such a big number, people can't get their heads around it. So maybe, you know, as you're figuring out how to communicate with people where you made improvements, somehow you need to make it bite size. Jack, I'd make a couple of points. One, uh... We advertise at this meeting, we get over at 8.30 and we're at 8.45. I understand there's a lot of information. We haven't had a lot of discussion. And I, I certainly would uh, suggest that uh, we don't uh, preclude at our next meeting additional conversation. I mean, there's only so much the uh, body can endure at about nine o'clock at night and try to come to <laughs> some thoughtful discussion. So I think the chair made some points about uh, putting something in writing or bringing it back to another meeting. So I. Yeah, I hope you're not disappointed. You're not going to get lots of questions. I mean, there's been an information overload. And that's, oh, uh, that's all on one night. And then you're saying, okay, what do you, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> kind of like giving a whole bunch of information to a student and saying, I want to test you right now on it after three hours of uh, you know information. So yeah. I know you're an asset, Commissioner Roger. Um, so yes, your point is well taken. We will... Yeah, it's your committee's meeting, obviously, so I won't be disappointed if there's not enough questions. Uh, before we move on to the next component, I just wanted to check if Chair Harrington has a comment. Yeah, I wanted to ask our community members while we have them. Uh, we've mentioned during the course of this evening that uh, there are some different areas where uh, there were additional requests from various departments, and we weren't able the CAO wasn't able to include them in the current proposed budget. So that's where we've uh, identified a supplemental budget conversation. But also we know we have the American Rescue Plan dollars coming in. And uh, I would really appreciate as one member of the board and one member of the budget committee, if you could help uh, be a set of eyes and participants in how we go forward with those investments. And as the CAO said, that is outside of the scope of what you volunteered to do. So our staff will definitely follow up for the whole budget committee and survey you to see if you're open to that or not. But I just wanted to, to bring voice to 
to the request that I would really appreciate uh, your helping us with that because you do play a very important role. So thank you for considering that. Thank you, Chair Harrington. If it's okay with the committee, we'll move on to the next component of the, the presentation. And that would be the service directory for lighting number one. And if we can get the PowerPoint slide started again. And then I believe both Sheila and uh, Stacia sh should be available. So I'll hand it right over to you, Sheila. Okay, we'll try to make this quick. I realize it's very late. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. As shown on the map, the service district for lighting areas are, are noted in the teal blue color. The urban growth boundary is outlined in the darker gray and the cities are in the lighter gray. The service district for lighting areas are established in new developments, areas that are partitioned and neighborhoods with existing utility poles. Lighting on roads classified as arterials and collectors are typically funded by the road fund and not the district. When a service district or lighting assessment area is established, the property owners split the energy and maintenance costs equally. Road fund lights are paid for by the county and managed through our traffic engineering section. So next I'll turn the pre presentation over to our coordinator for the district, Stacia Sheeler, for an update on the makeup of the district and the LED conversion project. Hi, good evening. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, this next slide here, uh, we can move to that next slide. There we go. Um, there are currently 12,598 streetlights in the district. The energy and maintenance cost for the lights within the district are paid for by 47,020 tax lots. We have over 1,250 active assessment areas. And in the last five years, we've added 611 lights, 2,901 tax lots and 71 assessment areas. Each year during our rate setting process, we reconcile our SDL data against assessment and taxation and PGE records. This year, we transferred a small number of lights to road fund and to the cities due to annexations. There have been several developments within North Bethany this year that are not included in our annual rate setting, setting due to delays in construction. Those areas will be assessed during next year's rate setting. Due to the decorative lighting in North Bethany area, uh, those residents pay a higher rate for their lighting than most in the district. North Bethany pays approximately $176 per lot, and the average cost for other areas is $61 per lot, most areas closer to $20 to $30 per lot per year. The average is a bit skewed due to some areas having more decorative lighting than others. Um, when an SDL is formed, uh, the, there's a minimum and maximum cost uh, per lot that is determined. The maximum cost is always calculated at double the minimum cost. The, uh, excuse me there, uh, the older assessment areas um, from years ago were not calculated, uh, their maximums weren't calculated using any particular formula. Those maximums uh, were chosen at a random, a random amount. If the cost is going to um, exceed that approved maximum amount at any point, the residents are notified by mail and a public hearing is required. So we do monitor that each year during rate setting to see if there's any of those older ones that will be exceeding maximum with the cost increase over time. Next slide, please. As you can see from uh, this slide here, it's a quick recap of where PGE is currently with our LED conversion project to remove all high pressure sodium or HPS, excuse me, HPS fixtures and replace them with the LED fixtures. So we've uh, successfully completed 2000 plus uh, conversions so far with PGE. Um, and you can see the other numbers there, 1,371 conversions are planned for this coming fiscal year with 4,310 planned for the following year. Next slide, please. In this slide here, you'll see some photos of the uh, newer lighting that we have um, been currently installing with PGE, the acorn lighting on your left, the uh, roadway or cobra head shoebox lighting in the center and the town and country lighting on the far right. Um, in the green box above, um, on this slide, you'll see there are many benefits to LED lighting. Some of the uh, misconceptions about LED lights um, there's a perception that the LED lights are brighter because they have how the lighting looks 
when it's emitted from the fixtures. LED technology allows a color temperature, brightness, and upward waste light to be controlled to reduce the light pollution. Um, LED lights project the lighting actually down onto the roadway and eliminate the up light and back light. Um, LED lighting is free of harsh chemicals. It does not emit any UV rays. And it's also 100% recyclable and can reduce the carbon footprint. Um, just as a slight comparison, one LED does the same work as 25 incandescent bulbs. Um, the current uh, LED conversions completed so far, as I mentioned, this is a breakdown by type. Uh, is 182 acorn lights, 181 cobra heads, 215 town and country, 1,452 shoebox, a total of 2,030 total so far. Um, PG estimates they will complete the remaining 1,371 roadway fixtures, as I mentioned before, in this next coming fiscal year, and the additional 4,300 plus in the following fiscal year. Next slide, please. Uh, we offer some constituent services that some people don't realize. Um, there are neighborhoods can request lighting to be added to their area. When a request is received, we find out if the requester is willing to become our point of contact in the neighborhood. Then PGE reviews the area, finds out if it's possible to add lighting um, to existing poles, verifies the potential location of lighting and prepares a cost estimate. A petition is then sent to all residents with the information and if 51% of them sign in favor, uh, we move on to get the board approval through the agenda process. We currently have two areas requesting lighting and are working through those details. Uh, PGE did uh, get delayed with some of the storms in, in earlier this year, and so they're still playing catch up on some of their work. But one of those is at Southwest Colony Drive near Southwest Bull Mountain in Roshack. Uh, the other is Southwest 107th Avenue and Southwest Hawthorne Lane near um, or east of Highway 217 and north of Walker. Um, area lights are sometimes a better option if someone requests lighting um, but doesn't want to work with their neighbors or go through that long process. Um, an area light costs a resident approximately $5 a year, and it's installed by PGE. They, uh, there haven't been any requests for those this over this past year, which is um, not usual. Usually we get at least a few. Um, sh uh, lighting shields can be requested by a property owner um, if they're having uh, problems with light glare or anything like that from the older lighting and some from the, the perceived um, LED lighting that's uh, affecting their homes. Um, that those are installed at the property owner's expense. The cost is $150 per shield. And that is mostly to cover just the PGE time to uh, get a crew out there and get that shield installed. The shields themselves are very inexpensive. We've seen a large increase in the number of shield requests with uh, people seeing the LED lighting coming into their neighborhoods and feeling that uh, brightness of the, the different type of light. Uh, once we explain the benefits of the conversion, most callers decide they might not need a shield. Um, there are a few that still insist and we'll go through the process of the shield installation. Next slide, please. Okay, breaking down the budget, you can see that our material and supplies is our largest category in the budget uh, where the utility costs show up. Additionally, ex additional expenditures, including advertising and postage and printing, are also uh, in the materials and supplies category. Interfund expenditures include staff costs for district su staff support, including county indirect charges. And then transfers to other funds that reflects a transfer to the road fund as part of the department's cost allocation plan. And finally, we've realized a notable decrease in the contingency as staff expenditures have been higher than anticipated, in part due to the development of a new asset management system. The system will be used for department wide asset management and will replace the service district's access database tool as well as other less efficient data collection systems. 90% of the contingency reserves are designed to cover four and a half months of utility costs, July 1 through the middle of November, when property tax payments start arriving in assessment and taxation. The service district assessments are included on the property tax statements. The remaining portion of the contingency fund is used to cover operating expenses and county staff management of the district. Next slide, please. So just another way of, of showing the, the budget. This appears on the online version on page 310. And it 
we see an overall decrease in revenues and a modest increase in expenditures. Uh, the decrease in revenues is primarily reflects a reduced amount of interest income. The increase in expenditures is due to a rate increase by PGE for utility costs in the coming year. The monthly utility cost is approximately $173,000. Over time, we should recognize the substantial savings in energy costs due to the conversion of all district lighting to LED fixtures instead of the high pressure sodium. Staffing costs have increased and include district staff, assessment and taxation, information technology, and GIS staff that support district uh, activities. The adjustments in revenue expenditures creates a decrease in the dis district's contingency fund. As previously noted, the contingency fund is in place to cover approximately four and a half months of operating costs that are not covered until later in the year when property taxes and assessments are paid for by the property owners. The property tax statements are strictly used as a billing mechanism for the district's assessments, but these are not charges, are not a tax. This concludes our presentation of the service district for lighting proposed budget. Thank you, Sheila and Stacia. So this is another opportunity for the committee to ask questions or have any comments or deliberations. <laughs> All right, so I'm not hearing any questions. We'll move on to the next slide. We'll quickly go over the next steps. Next meeting for this committee is May 26, 2021. And uh, because we have three meetings connected together, this particular budget committee starts at 7.30 and then can potentially end at nine o'clock. Um, I have to say that the public hearing is usually for the Washington County Budget Committee is a, a little bit longer one. So I definitely would uh, want to advise everyone to reserve some time for rest before the next meeting. And then the pu public testimony at that meeting is scheduled at 8 p.m. And then we have the budget committee to consider approving the proposed budget. So at the next budget hearing, the action of the committee will be approving the budget. Uh, I see Chair Harrington has, uh, may have a comment. I have a question, Jack. So mm -hmm. uh, you, and, you and your team will be reviewing all of our questions and uh, we'll get some written material from you and Ms. Angie. Uh, but when we come back on May 26, then convene ourselves as the Washington County and SDL number one budget committee. If we have any remaining questions on that or comments, will we be able to pursue those questions that evening either before or after the public hearing? Absolutely, definitely. So there will be, besides the public hearing, there will be quite a bit of time that's uh, um, reserved for the deliberation as well. So yeah. Okay. Before, before you take action to approve the budget as a committee, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. And then um, after the, public hearing, we have the Board of County Commissioners to adopt the budget, which is scheduled on June, June 15th, 2021. And that is at the 10 o'clock AM uh, board meeting, regular board meeting. Public testimony is available both at the budget committee public hearing as well as at the board meeting um, on June 15th. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I would like to hand it back to the committee chair, Karen Balling, to consider adjourning the meeting. Do I need a motion or can I just adjourn? Uh, usually for this one, I, th I mean, a motion will be the most formal way to do it. Um, I've, I've seen budget committees done it without a motion also. So it's, uh, it's really your committee's preference. <laughs> I would like to just adjourn the meeting. <laughs> I think we'd all support that. <laughs> all right. Nice work, everyone. Good job, staff. Good job, Jack. Everything went Thanks really smooth. Coming. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye bye. Good bye. job, staff. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, commissioners. We will see you next week. Thank you, Kevin.